This meeting is being recorded. This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena, straight out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And folks, here we are on October 18th, 2022, and we are celebrating the 10th anniversary. I can't believe it's been 10 years of a movie I saw in the theater back in the day called The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And I got the whole Blu-ray right there. There you go. 10th anniversary. I can't believe it. Folks, I have somebody from that film on the show today, and she is proven already to be a wonderful soul. <laughs> Folks, I give you the lovely Jennifer Onscott. How do you do, Jennifer? Hi, Greg. I'm fine. I know I know you've had a rough morning, but it's better now. Actually, Pretty let me here. get Pretty into that. Time. You know, folks, I work at the hospital here. You know, I do a lot of overnights. I have my alarm set. And um, I know there's people out there that can relate to this. You don't hear them when they go off. Because I know you told me your daughter had such a thing happen. and. Um, you but you were so understanding and so wonderful when I contacted you. I want to say first off, thank you for being a, a lovely human being, you know, because some people would have felt disrespected and I would not have blamed them one bit, but uh, that that's my excuse, you know. <laughs> Well, that, uh, thank you, Greg. No, I was raised to never get a big head. Uh, in fact, there were times in my childhood where I actually accomplished something really, really cool and called to tell my parents and my dad said, don't get conceited now. It's like you mm -hmm. could at least say congratulations first. <laughs> so I was never allowed to think that I was above someone's alarm not going off or them not hearing it or, or you know, whatever. It's just... It's just a small hitch, but we're here now, so it's fine. We are here now, but I know you was telling me uh, your daughter had a very close call trying to <laughs> get. Oh my gosh, she was she was working background on a television show out in Long Island, actually working. She has this really cool scene too with uh, another person who was in the cast of Perks, which we thought was hilarious because then. It, it was Aaron Wilhelmy who played Alice in the film and uh, Aaron and I were messaging each other saying, oh my God, what are the odds of all the people? There were like 70 people in background that day and they picked my daughter to do the scene with you. <laughs> like, wow, that's so cool. But she almost didn't make it. She had about five minutes. She woke up saying, oh, I slept through four alarms and had five minutes to run to the subway station to get to the bus that was picking her up at 3 a.m to drive her out to the location way out on, on Long Island. And uh, so it's like, I just went through that anxiety with her. So <laughs> yours was, all you had to do was turn around and turn your computer on. It was now. Yeah, good. my messy apartment. I can't get my cat to clean the apartment up. I, I do how- right You sound asleep. Is that what yours does? Just sleeping, just yeah. taking it easy. Yeah, I- um... Yeah, I do lots of cleaning at the hospital and housekeeping, COVID cleaning, all of the above. Last night I did labs, which was a first for me. And um, I come home and I still got to clean. Can't get yeah. Skittles to get off his butt to do it. <laughs> it's like, really? Well, what is the point? He's supposed to be earning his keep. That's what I yeah. keep telling Fess, and it's not working. It's not working any better for me than it is for you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that seems to be how it is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd you say your daughter was working with out of Perks? Erin Wilhelmy. She played Alice. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, with the pale, pale blonde hair. Yeah, we've stayed in touch. I, and yeah. I was working on a, a comedy web series a few years back, and we actually had an episode where Erin was going to play my daughter, and she ended up not being able to do it because she was on Broadway at the time doing the Crucible and she was going to go on as Mary Warren. She was an understudy for that part. She had she was cast, but in a smaller role and she was gonna go on. So she had understudy rehearsals. So 
um, she found me a great replacement. So that was fine. But we thought, ah, dang it, we almost worked together again. But then what was great was then she ends up working with my daughter. <laughs> it's such a small world. This business really is a small, you keep banging into the same people eventually, uh, again and again. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, yeah, I, I love this film. Like I said, I saw it when it came out and um, it was one of those films I'm surprised we actually even got because, I mean, we got a 10 screen theater here, but that doesn't mean that we're going to get because uh, we get a lot of the big blockbuster movies on yes. uh, several screens, you know, and. I'm kind of like it. It's hit or miss for me how many of those I decide to go to, and right. And, yeah, uh, the same where I am because I'm living in a in a small town in Ohio now, and it did not come here, but it went to Cleveland and Columbus and Cincinnati, and you know it went to the bigger cities, mm -hmm. and so people saw. I mean, it was a success. It's just that it. I think the reason why it was a tough sell here is the same reason why the book was a tough sell here. So my, uh, I have a girlfriend who just retired being a high school librarian and mm -hmm. she kept a copy of Perks behind her desk and she said she can't put it on the shelf because there will be parents who will flip their lids if they know that their child, child, I mean, you know, a 16, 17 year old, something like that, was reading a book that had a gay character, that had sexual situations, that talked about an adult abusing a child, you know, so many of these topics. But she said, I know this book has saved lives. So she would give it out to the appropriate student at the appropriate time and say, maybe just keep it in your book bag so your folks don't see. She didn't want to have parents raining down on her head. So because I guess it's, uh, you know, the school district was not very progressive. So I, I think that's the same reason why it wouldn't show up at our local Cineplex. You know um, what, I find it funny. I, I can't stand that level of judgment that people have, you know. Um, it's, on... it's nuts. And you know, I'll tell you what, so like, in the process of auditioning for this. So my kids were a little bit too old when The Perks of Being a Wallflower came out, the book. Mm -hmm. They weren't aware of it because they were older. Um, so they were probably already in college or out of, co I, don't, I don't remember but the year, but you know, they just, it went over their heads. So I wasn't aware of it. So I got the call from my agent. I have an agent in Pittsburgh you know, a lot of these, a lot of large budget films come and shoot in the Midwest now because um, they get tax breaks. So they save millions of dollars. And it's really great for actors like me, who, I mean, I, I used to live in LA and I worked a lot in LA. I didn't move here and forget how to do it. I moved here because my parents were aging and they needed my help. And it was nice for my kids to have, to be closer to their grandparents and so forth. It, it was the right thing to do at the time. And then suddenly the work started coming here. And my friends in LA were saying, hey, don't come back. You're getting more auditions than we are. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny how the business has changed. You don't have to live in LA or New York now uh, to do this. So in fact, I live just a couple miles away from Shawshank Prison where that oh. was shot. And I have, I have a, friends who were in that film, Jim Kosicki, who played the banker. Okay. You know, when he's, yeah, he played my dad in a television commercial that we shot here. Uh, you know, so I, it, it's not weird now to be an actor. Shawshank Redemption, weird. what a great movie. Great, great movie. So, you know, the, the jobs sometimes are coming to us. So anyway, um, I got this audition from my agent in Pittsburgh, who is also my agent in Cleveland. It's the same company. And they said, so I didn't know where it was going to shoot. They said, oh, you have an audition. They sent me this scene. It was such a cool scene, which is, isn't in the film. <laughs> I'll tell you about this scene, though. It had a little parental steel. It had anxiety. It had oceans of relief. I mean, it was a wonderful scene between Sam and her mom. So I'm reading for Sam's mom, which in my mind, Sam could be a guy. I don't know this book. I didn't know it was a book. I just had to see a scene in a movie. So I go up and I do the audition. 
when you're a working actor, there's a lot of auditioning. So it's not like you hang on to that. I just, I really enjoyed doing that scene because it had so many different levels. And that's your job is to find what's in the scene that's not necessarily what's written on the paper. Who am I? Why am I saying this? What do I want? What's going on? Where's the conflict? Uh, that's kind of stuff. So, and I've been doing this since I was four. So, you know, I, it's, it's not that hard for me to come up with my choices. So I go home and immediately forget about it and move on to the next auditions. A couple of weeks later, I get a phone call from my agent who's extra excited, way more excited than usual. She goes, you got a call back for Perks of Being a Wallflower. Oh my gosh, the director wants to meet you. you you've got, you're going to go to Pittsburgh. And like, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So I Google Sam, the Perks of Being a Wallflower, because I'm thinking if I know who's playing Sam, I'm, I'm assuming Sam's a major character because Sam has a name. I'm Sam's mom. I'm less important. But if I can then know who's playing Sam and I could maybe shade something that I'm going to do to make sure I incorporate who that celebrity is. Go, oh, my God. It's Emma Watson. <laughs> Hermione. Thought, All right. I don't have to do anything here. <laughs> I don't, no, I don't need to change anything about how I look. I'm just going to go in and do the scene that I did the first time. I mean, obviously... Stephen Spassky liked what I did or I wouldn't be called back. So I go out right away and I buy the book. It's a slim novel. I recommend it. If you haven't read the book, I have it's very, it's very similar to the film. Now the, the original film script, I have various versions of the script here. Stephen's original script has more in it than what ended up being because the, um, one of the production companies involved, Summit Entertainment. A lot of people think that directors are the boss. They are on the shoot, but they have a boss and their boss is the production company. And the production company decided they wanted way less parental involvement in the kids' lives, which is a bummer because I was in these scenes. I started out with five scenes and in the end, I'm like barely in two. Um, but I mean, that's just, that's the nature of the business. They wanted it to be much more about the kids than about the families. And I'm not necessarily saying that they're wrong because they knew their target audience and it's a business decision. On the other hand, the scene Stephen wrote was so good. <laughs> it's not there. Um, but anyway, I get the book. That scene's not in the book either. I read it. Now, here I was at this point already absolutely an adult with grown kids, and I learned stuff. When I was growing up, when I came of age, rape meant a man forcing a woman to have sex, and it mm -hmm. had to be the act. There couldn't be anything like, oh, they only did this or that. No, the act. And in order for her to prevail, if she cried rape, she had to be virginal. She had to only wear dresses that came up to here. She had to have never had sex before. She had, otherwise it was somehow, she was the one who was faulted. She wanted it. She asked for it. You can't, she was drunk, you know, all this nonsense. And the perks of being a wallflower, wow. I love how the concept of rape has evolved as it should into meaning coercing, humiliating, pulling a girl into doing something she doesn't want to do, no matter what it is. And it doesn't have to even be the act. And so I'm reading this book and I'm like, dang, Stephen Shbosky, you taught me something. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I talked to my daughter, who at that point was a young adult. And she said, yeah, like, how did you not know that? And I said, see, you grew up in a very different world than I did. That's how come I I, it, it opened my eyes that to something that I wish my age group, I wish, especially the girls, we had been more aware because we put up with guys thinking that it was totally fine to just pressure, 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 coerce, you know, I'll, I'll take you to prom, you know, whatever, <laughs> to get a girl to do something that he wanted. And, you know, it's uncool. You shouldn't do that. That's not consent. So... I was really intrigued by reading this book. At this point, I hadn't read the entire script, but I loved the scene. I loved this. I drive to the call back in Pittsburgh. There's only one other woman there. 
to read for Sam's mom. So they really wanted a small callback. They picked just a couple people for each role. And um, she was very lovely. We sat and chatted for a little bit. Uh, I, they called her in first. And <laughs> this is bad because I wouldn't, I would never do this on purpose. <laughs> they called her in first and I went into the bathroom because I just wanted to check my hair and my makeup because I had that minute. And as I came back, I'm walking down the hall and the door to the audition room was right there. And I, it was paper thin. I heard her audition and there was nothing wrong with it. She said the words and she certainly also looked enough like Emma that she was believable in that sense. But here's my advice to any aspiring actor out there. Saying the words right and looking like the, the person who's gonna play your relative, you have just opened the door for somebody who actually did the work, went and read the book and figured out who this fam what the family dynamic is and broke the scene down into the moments of shifting gears, just saying the words. She let me in. It was mine to lose at that point. I knew that role was mine to lose. So I went in and I read the scene the way that I had decided I wanted to do it. And there was a beat of silence afterwards. And Stephen said, that was excellent. And I thought, I just booked a movie with Emma Watson. <laughs> in fact, I met Stephen a few years later, my daughter, the one we were just talking about, she uh, worked at Strand Books in New York for a long time and she was the events coordinator. And Stephen's wife, Liz Macy, she wrote a young adult book called Lessons I Never Learned at Meadowbrook Academy. This is Stephen's wife. And they were having a book launch for it at Strand. So my daughter wrote me, mom, Stephen Shpotsky is going to come because when you're not a famous author, Strand wants you to have somebody famous there with you who can like be the interlocutor asking you the questions and so forth to make the event a sellout. So Stephen was there. And so I decided, well, hi, hi, Skittles. So I decided Skittles. to show <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Skittles? So are, are, are you, you perked up to be a wallflower? Oh, Skittles isn't a wallflower. Look at that face. <laughs> Hi, so kitty. I, show, I show up at the event and Stephen is there and Aaron showed up too. Also, I saw Aaron that day as well. And Stephen, well, he inscribed both my, this is the book I brought with me to Pittsburgh to shoot. He signed that, but this one, this is so cute. He told everybody there at the book, at his wife's book launch about this great scene he wrote and how it wasn't in the film. And he wrote, Jennifer, beautiful Sam's mom forever and ever. Thank you for the beautiful reading and the beautiful scene. I'll remember it forever, Stephen Shpasky. Well, you know, you would have had to have been in the room to remember it because nobody else saw it. Wow. <laughs> but, you know, um, that was great. Yeah. It was a great scene. So anyway, I did book it and um, it was really a, a, a good time. I mean, I, I think... See, 10 years ago now, Greg, I don't know if I'm going to remember stuff in order. I think I met Emma first. I was in the um, trailer when we were just, I, we, I don't know if they were ready to do my hair or makeup, but we were discussing hair and makeup. And Emma came in and she knew I was going to be there that day. She's like, mom. <laughs> and first thing we did was look in the mirror and like, okay, yeah, our eyes are a lot alike, different color, but they're a lot alike. And we're, we're just sort of picking apart our features and I told her how I thought it was such a great idea for her to do this film because this was the first one she shot. I don't think it was the first one released after Harry Potter, but it was the first project she shot after Harry Potter. And um, it was such a departure. Yeah. Because she, she wanted to show, stop thinking of me as just Hermione. I can do this other thing. Um, and I mean, we had a good time. I, I didn't get to know her well, Emma's level of fame is such that even on location, she's going to be kind of kept separate because people who are that famous are really never left alone. And um, everybody else, we just kind of hung out in, in our house, you know, the house in the film that's my, supposed to be my house. They had a, a finished basement and we were just all sorted down there. And there was a production office down there. In fact, I heard 
uh, one of the production assistants on the phone booking Joan Cusack to, to play the doctor. She actually had just gotten confirmation they were arranging her flights in. So it was just kind of, that's where I was most of the time. We all had trailers, but I, I was barely ever in there. That That's less interesting. I'd much rather hang out with the folks. Yeah. Well, you know what? I I love Emma Watson. I don't have an Emma Watson t-shirt, but I do have an Emma shirt. <laughs> That's close. I got Emma Stone here from Easy A. <laughs> right. <laughs> but That's cute. Yeah. Um, I love this movie. I saw this in Pitch Perfect, I think, right on the same billing. And I loved both films. That was a good night at the theater, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. That's Seeing a good both deal. of those. Yeah. And um, this spoke to me a lot, you know, because I was, uh, I mean, I'm, I turned 50 this year. You know, so I've been out of high school for a while, but I still remember and relate to a lot of stuff going on in this film, you know, and um, it does have a timeless quality about it as far as just the difficulties of coming of age and, uh, you know, like Patrick's relationship with his boyfriend and how that had to be secret because the boyfriend was the captain of the football team. I mean, these are things that kids, if you don't have that scenario, you have something similar. And it, he really just kind of, Stephen just, I mean, I think it's a masterpiece. He just touched so many themes that you could turn it to relate to something in your own life. And of course, Emma Watson being as uh, lovely on the eyes as she is, gave me another reason to go see it. You know? She's but, adorable. She's yeah. adorable. Yeah. In fact, this one, uh, she and she's really sweet. I mean, uh, drops a lot more f bombs than you might think, but <laughs> um, <Nice. laughs> they. So I shot two days. I'm supposed to shoot more, but the, I'll tell you about that in a minute. The, so after the first day, I knew I was coming back. There was a weekend in between, and that in between weekend on Sunday, the Tony Awards were on television, mm -hmm. and that was when Daniel Radcliffe was doing How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, and he was part of a big production number on the Tonys, and I was watching it. Well, I knew that Emma wasn't watching it because they took the kids to a uh, Philadelphia Phillies uh, baseball game and had them up in a box and they had a blast. So like, here she is, she's British. She doesn't know baseball. So, I mean, she really had a good time. So then we're back on location on Monday and I asked her how her weekend was and she said it was really great. And I said, I watched your friend. And she knew right away <laughs> what I was talking about. She said, how was he? How was he? Because, you know, that's a big live performance. And here's the thing, when you are famous from the movies and you decide you want to do Broadway, that can be an incredibly judgmental group. The theater, you know, theater snob. I, I do theater I, too. I, I know it's there, it's there. There's a thing, it's like people say, you do films to become famous, you do television to become rich, you do theater to learn how to act. And that's not exactly fair because there are a lot of people in the different categories who have achieved those different things, not in that order. But they can be very judgmental of a film actor coming in. So there was that, but also it was a dance number. So there's Daniel Radcliffe doing a dance number with this huge group of Broadway dancers. This is the highest level of dance ability. It's amazing what they can do. And he kept up. And I told that to Emma, I said, it's not like he moved well, he danced. I'm a dancer. Well, I was I'm too old now, but I mean, I was, I did musicals. I danced in musicals. He was right there, just nailing it. And she went like this. Ah! <laughs> she was so excited because her friend, I mean, she's sweet. She's sweet. She's really supportive of her friends. I mean, it was nice. I wish I could have gotten to talk to her more, but like I said, she was kind of off. And in fact, when we were getting ready to shoot a scene that isn't in the film, what you see the scene where Charlie's approaching, it's Christmas, he's approaching the house and he's got like the Santa Claus sack over his shoulder. Well, the scene that's cut, he comes to the door and knocks on the door and I open the door with my husband. And this was why Summit thought, two minutes, two, parents, don't want parents. And Stephen's direction to me was, 
This is the first time a boy has shown up at the house to see your daughter that you approve the look of. <laughs> so I guess apparently I haven't liked any of them until now. So like, hi, and he introduces himself. And I mean, it's a brief conversation, but it's very telling. But again, I, seriously, you would think that these kids don't have parents the way the, the film was finally put together. So um, we were getting ready to shoot that scene. So they're lighting everything outside. And I was sitting on the staircase. It's, it's that kind of house of colonial. You open the door and there's a staircase that goes up. So I'm just sitting there waiting and I needed to use the bathroom. Well, I didn't feel like going all the way down to the basement where I'm sure it was gonna be crowded. And this is a house with bedrooms upstairs. I'm sure there's a bathroom upstairs. So I turn around and start going up the stairs and I hear someone, I hear a walkie talkie conversation. Who's going up the stairs? And they said, it's okay, it's the mom. So I thought, why would they care? What's so secret about, what's so special about going upstairs? So I go upstairs and I use the bathroom and I come out and there's Emma coming out of the bedroom. She heard somebody coming out of the bathroom and she came out of the bedroom. I thought, that's why they're protecting her. They're making sure nobody comes up to pester her. So we, we chatted for a couple of minutes and I was just about to ask her, are you lonely up here? Do you want me to hang out with you? I mean, I was surprised she was there. I, I thought she was gone because what we had shot with her earlier, that was done. And um, then they were ready for me. So I just said, oh, okay, see ya. And I go down and I, I do my bit. And then afterwards I went up to see if she was still up there and she had left, she had been taken away. But see, you, she would be whisked. In fact, here's another story for you. We're at our trailers and they would get a van because the trailers are kind of too far from the house for us to walk. And they would bring a van to take us. And this one time the cast is getting in the van and suddenly a woman who lived in the neighborhood, she is right there trying to get onto the van to get Emma's autograph for her child. But she like pushed her way onto the van. And what she didn't realize was this very slim, attractive young woman who was there was Emma's bodyguard. And she had her down on the ground in a flash. And, and uh, she said, I promised my daughter I'd get an autograph. And she said, you shouldn't make promises you can't keep. I mean, this is, she has to have protection. This woman, I believe genuinely wanted an autograph, but you don't know I mean, look what happened to John Lennon all those years ago with somebody yeah. asking for an autograph. You don't know. People are nuts. So, I, you know, I, I fame, a lot of people want it. I'm kind of glad that I can walk down the street and nobody bothers me. It's funny, though. I'll meet people and they'll find out what I do and they'll say, oh, are you famous? <laughs> say, you know you what? Know it's who I was. Obviously, No. <laughs> Bill Murray put it best when he was on the Howard Stern show, you know, um, between being rich and being famous, he said, try being rich and see if that solves a lot of your problems. <laughs> I think that's an excellent outlook. Yeah. Being famous, you can't, you don't get to turn that off because they also tried another weekend the kids tried emma put on a wig and it was all disguised and they tried to go to the movies and it didn't work within 10 minutes the mall was just crushed with people it's not a normal life and at least you know the people they love her but i think she handles it beautifully it's just a weird sort of way to have to navigate your life um I've had brushes of it because if I was working on a certain project, then people were watching me. I had a lot of people in the neighborhood come and ask for my autograph on perks. I mean, there have been other scenarios, but then see at the end of the shoot, I go home, I can go to the grocery store and nobody notices me and it's nice. So like if I roll out of bed and don't feel like washing my hair, I'm not going to be shamed all over the internet for being a pig. You have beautiful <laughs> hair, by the way. Oh, thank you. I stopped coloring it. Isn't it awesome? I'm an old lady now and I love the white streak. Oh, you it's look amazing. great. Old lady, my <laughs> ass, you know, you look great, but I love your hair. Thanks. Well, yeah. I, I could have been your babysitter. So, you know, I am up there, but, um, thank you. Anyway, I'm, I'm really happy about how the hair is going. I, if there it just you keeps go. going wider and wider, I'm okay with it. There you go. There you go. Well, you know what? Um, um, I, um, 
I see exactly what you're saying because, um, like, I can't believe I'm able to do this because, I mean, back in uh, – when I graduated high school, we still had typewriters. We still <laughs> – you have phones yeah, yeah. That stuck to the wall. Oh, I yeah. mean, I could yeah. see. And now I'm able to do these interviews with people from these movies, you know, and it's quite, it, you know, I, I it's kind of like, am I really doing this, you know? And uh, I don't get paid <laughs> to do we're, this, we're, but I had. We're definitely a con connected in a different way than we used to be. For better yeah. or worse, I mean, sometimes maybe it's it's not all good, but um, in this instance, it's nice. But I mean, I had a Canadian actress, and I took her up for, on it, uh, who I've known since the '80s, invite me to my first convention, and she oh, and I God. have remained friends ever since. In fact, she's on my resume as a reference. Neat. Yeah, and. Um, and uh, I'm going to see her when I go back to Toronto, too, uh, at the end of the month. Uh, we become friends, you know, and uh, and it's interesting, you know, and but I've come to the point now because I come to the point long ago. But when she invited me to my first con, it was kind of like. I know this person from these movies, but. She's asking me a lot of questions about New Brunswick and Fredericton, you know, where I'm from. And yeah. I'm getting to know this person as a human being, not that's as a it, character. As a human. And I think that's what happens. A lot of people, you don't realize they're just people. And mm -hmm. especially, I mean, I've told this story several times because I, I think it's really funny. So people like me, the actors who are like, I, I'll say journeymen, we're journeyman actors. We make a living in this business. We are not celebrities. So when people say, are you famous? I have to laugh. I say, no, but I work with famous people. <laughs> you know, you get to know famous people, but that's not who I am. And so I recommend, I came up with this idea back when Terminator first came out. So you could apply it to any big blockbuster movie now. But I would say, have you seen Terminator? They say, yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to go see it next week. Okay. When you go see Terminator, while the film is screening, ask yourself, how many actors can I name? And don't cheat because now you have IMDb. Don't look it up ahead of time. So just see how many you can name. And if you don't really pay attention to the business, you could name Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's it. If you pay attention to the business, there might be a few other actors you can name. And that might be what? Three, four, five. If you if you really know a lot of actors, then stay for the credits. Count how many actors are credited in the credits. They're not going to credit extras. So it's and, and you know there might be like what 50, 75, 100 in a big depends on the blockbuster movie. That's the rest of us. We buy houses, we buy cars, we put our kids through college, we take vacations, we cook meals, we do our laundry. We, this just happens to be the business that we're in. And we're not always in a film like The Perks of Being a Wallflower, but I've made like 400 television commercials. I've made a really good living. I've done loads and loads of plays. Um, I'm out there doing this work. Um, you may not know who I am, but Steven Spassky knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and he thinks I'm good. And that's all that matters. I have an agent who thought, hey, she'd be right for this. I'm going to submit her for it. You know, this is how the business works. So fame is just like, man, set that on a shelf. It really yeah. just confuses the issue. It is nice. Of course, my my actress friend from Toronto, um, she said it's nice to, to walk down the street and you know, I mean, she says she wears makeup, people recognize her, you know, but if she's dressed down, you know, and I've uh -huh. been around with her in Toronto, you know, because uh, we send each other Christmas cards and Christmas gifts. We're on that level now. So, I mean, she sent my cat a cat <laughs> stocking last Christmas, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's family now. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, she has I have, helped. I have a good friend from high school. Yeah. Who, if I start telling you the cartoon characters he plays, you know him. 
Everyone listening knows him. He is a superstar in the voiceover world. He and I will get together and go out to lunch and we're sitting in a room and I would say, if you started talking like Yakko or Pinky or a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, everybody in this room would go, ah! And we're sitting here and nobody knows who you are. His, his name's Rob Paulson. Nobody knows who he is because it's his voice. It's his incredibly versatile voice. And he was doing those voices in high school. He was the kid who was always cutting up. I mean, we, we've known each other since we were teenagers. And it's just so funny because he's got what I consider the perfect scenario. He works all the time. He, I think he has more IMDb credits than anyone I know. He has thousands and thousands of them. And yet nobody recognizes him when he walks down the street. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't know anybody else who kind of has managed to have one foot in each camp, super, super famous, and yet nobody knows who he is. There you go. There you go. But yeah. if he dressed as a Ninja Turtle, maybe. <laughs> I think, yeah. I mean, really, if he says narf, then suddenly <laughs> all heads would turn. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but nonetheless, yeah, I agree. And uh, I know a lot of people that get into podcasting to be famous me here's the thing with me i got a job that pays me really well and it's very satisfying working at the hospital you know i got co-workers that are wonderful you know oh, that's absolutely everything. that right there is gold if, you know yeah if you, if you have a wonderful team of co-workers you're set yep and um as far as this goes, like my interviews eventually go up on YouTube. I got subscribers, but I don't have like my, my thing's not monetized. I'm going to tell you one of the big reasons why it's not monetized. And it was talking to my friend from Toronto. I don't, and I'm not judging other people in podcasting. They have their reasons. I don't monetize it because it feels like I'm using these people to get ahead. Mm. You know? Yeah, I see. I'm, on the other hand, you know, you are doing work and there's nothing wrong with getting paid to do work. Mm -hmm. Although I think you see it more as a labor of love. I enjoy it. Like I purposely, like when Perks of Being a Wildflower was on the 10 year anniversary, I, I really wanted to get somebody on here from that movie. And I'm so happy when you responded. And um, I didn't reach out to Emma Watson, obviously, you know, but, <laughs> but, but still, um, I, I was really happy to be able to highlight this film for 2022 because, you know, yeah. people will listen to this and they'll be like, gee, you know, uh, I should relook at that film. It's been a while, you know, or people are like, oh, never heard of this. This sounds interesting. Should yeah, check I think this it, out. It, it, it was shot in, yeah, we, well, we shot it about 11 years ago, but um, it was set in the early 90s. So it already had a timelessness about it because it was period. I mean, and, and it's a period that was not that far removed from when it was shot. So it was an interesting challenge for wardrobe to find the clothes that weren't, it's, it's easier to find clothes from a hundred years ago than it is to find clothes from 10 years ago. <laughs> so, um, you know, but they did it. I mean, I, I think, I think everything worked really well on that. So, um, Here's another like slight angle. We could talk about Ezra a little bit uh, 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 where fame kind of can get in your way. Um, Ezra Miller, I mean, he's been in the news lately and it's not yeah. good. Uh, the last that I heard, see, I said he's been in the news. I know Ezra wants they, them, and I apologize in advance to anybody who would be offended. I will slip. Sorry, I will slip. I will try not to. When I met Ezra, it was him and he. <laughs> so that's how I think of that. I think of them. Um, I get where you're going with here too. Yeah, I, yeah. I, it's not, it's not, you know, I mean, no offense. Um, so anyway, I, he, it, they played my stepson. So I arrived on uh, the location. And like I said, the, the, the basement of the house was like a, a rec room. 
I wouldn't even want to say family room because it was more casual than that. It was more like a like painted cinder block walls. <laughs> you know, it was very casual. They and they shoved a lot of couches and chairs and stuff in there for all of us. And so I went down there and Ezra saw me across the room and it, I mean, they have our pictures up and stuff so they know who's coming. And it's also obvious, well, this is the scene with the mom and dad. So it, there was no surprise that I would walk in the room and Ezra came over right away, gave me this big warm hum and said, mom. And I don't know if this was partly a, a part of his method, of their method, or if uh, but I felt like um, my mom's come to visit me on set. <laughs> that was how it felt. That was the vibe I got from it. And we started talking. We sat down on the couch and we started talking. And my first impression, and I'm, I'm thinking this is still true, was an, an almost fragile, a vulnerable human being. There is a vulnerability there, which just was obvious it, it screamed at me this person is vulnerable and I think Ezra was about I think he was a teenager still when we shot this so um, vulnerable people generally make excellent actors they are able to just dive down into the recesses of their soul I mean if you haven't seen we need to talk about Kevin it is a masterpiece of a performance from Ezra it's he's Oh my gosh, Ezra is such a good actor. And all this stuff with Marvel and all that, that's great. You know, you can make a lot of money doing those films, but there is a quality to um, acting that is enhanced when you're a person who's got kind of a fragility inside of you. And I picked that up right away. I also picked up something else. And I will tell you right now that this is maybe unfair. Ezra had an entourage there with him. It was either two or three people, I can't remember. They were friends from like being in a band together or maybe some of them had been in a band with him or these, these were just friends. And I'm sure all someone like Ezra had to do was ask, can I have my friends on set with me? And the answer would have been yes. We, I couldn't have just brought people with me, but sometimes it's like having a support animal, I think, to have, your, have some people there that you know and you trust. But I didn't like them. I got a, a rather negative first impression from this entourage. First impressions can be wrong. Mm -hmm. I've been wrong before about my first impression of someone I met. And I do believe there have been people who, when they first met me, they got me wrong. So I recognize that, but it plays into what's happening over time. My impression was that these people saw in their friend, someone who brought attention to them. And so it, when they're hanging out with Ezra, the light is shining on them. So Ezra sitting on the couch talking to me and he's wanting to know, what am I up to? Oh, you're about to do a play in New York. What is that? You know, the, this conversation was about two humans making a connection because we're about to play mother and son. And it's like, no, 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 no. Come away from her. Come be with us. Be with, I don't get, get no us. And the personalities of these people were a lot stronger. Now this is, like I said, we shot it 11 years ago. I start hearing these stories and I'm thinking, oh my God, he, uh, was I right? Was I right? Was Ezra surrounded by the wrong people? I mean, those people probably left his life ages ago. But a vulnerable soul surrounded by the wrong people is going to go down the wrong path, psychologically, emotionally, everything. And that is not saying to make an excuse, because there is no excuse. If you hurt someone, if you broke the law, all that, you've got to pay the piper. you got to face it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I'm really happy that Ezra went into some sort of, I don't know if he went into a place that, um, for treatment, or if it was, I, I know that they were let out to complete a scene on a film that wasn't done yet. And some people are even furious about that. Like, wait a minute, they've spent tens of millions of dollars on this film. They need to finish it. Don't take it out on them. This isn't the fault of that production. They need to get their project done. If you now want to blackball that production, that is 100% up to you. You have that right. But they have the right to finish their, their film. Um, but 
what bothered me even then. So like after we shot it, but before the film came out, I happened somehow to bump into message boards and there was this conversation going on and the title of it, it, it had everything to do with perks, but this particular subcategory, it said, Ezra Miller is a weirdo. And it was people just bashing Ezra for being different. And I jumped on, now I used a pseudonym and I said, I'm in the cast of the perks of being a wallflower. And of course that started a flurry of people trying to guess who I was and they were all wrong. Everybody thought I was one of the kids. Um, I said, I have never met someone out, out of everyone that I met on that shoot. He was head and shoulders, the most, they were head and shoulders, the most, um, going out of their way to welcome, uh, spending time, genuine, sincere, fragile, just adorable. He was a lovely, lovely person. I, I felt lucky to have had those moments with Ezra. And here they are ravaging him just for being odd. And actually it was his oddness that I thought was the key <laughs> to playing the role so well. Yep. The, the quirkiness, the it's charming, it's wonderful. I think he, I, he, I keep saying he, I'm sorry. I think that they did a wonderful job in this role I have to get used to saying they instead of he. I'm just, ah, when you're, you, it's hard to switch gears. Um, anyway, now all this is happening. Uh, you talk about getting dragged through the dirt on the internet. Um, I think that a measure of understanding is important. And you know, it's funny because I cycle back to this morning when you slept through your alarm and you're like, you're so understanding, you're so understanding. It's like, no, Greg, I'm just a human. And I know that nobody's perfect and things don't always work like you think they're going to work. Yeah. And sometimes things go wrong. Now there's, there's a huge difference between holding someone captive and all this stuff uh, and sleeping through an alarm, but still, I think a measure of understanding what the hell happened, what happened? Was I right? And all those years ago, there was a, a sort of a vulnerability and it was taken advantage of. I don't know the first thing about Ezra's family. I don't know about who was around them over the years to maybe keep the, the demons at bay, keep the weird people away who are trying to take advantage. I don't know, but um, I'm hoping that they're helped in this facility and um, that they're able to go back to having that, you know, just that sweet, loving personality that I saw. I mean, that was 11 years ago. People can change. I just don't know. Can they Look change at Robert that Downey Jr. Exactly. Exactly. He was messed up back in the day, but boy, has he made a good, great turnaround. He has made good, and I, I hope that for Ezra. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I saw somewhere Stephen said that he wrote a text or an email or something when things started happening, just to kind of like in general, giving some support. You know, I love you. I care about you. I hope, all, I hope you find what you need and this all gets worked out. But, you know, you can't say, oh, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure he didn't do anything wrong. I'm not sure of any such thing. Um, anyway you I, know, you know as not somebody i'm in touch with he did want to come and see that play i was going to do in new york and then that particular play didn't happen or i would have maybe stayed uh, in touch with him longer <laughs> well perks is so layered you know first off on the background here what a great soundtrack this movie had you know i yeah. love the smiths and of course that yeah. song asleep is all through this movie you know mm -hmm. And um, I didn't realize what the song Asleep was until uh, I saw this movie, <laughs> what it was really yeah, all I about. Some of the, I knew some of the songs from it because like like David Bowie, <laughs> Heroes. And Steven yep. says, I swear to God, I hadn't heard the song. I didn't know who it was because that's what people were saying. How could you have not known that was Bowie? And he goes, I didn't know. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of that other music came out later when I was like busy raising kids. And so I wasn't as aware, but yeah, I bought the soundtrack. I've got it around here someplace. It is a really good soundtrack. Yep. And there was another song. Oh, I can't remember the band. Uh, 
Um, let me see. Because I'm going to bring it up here. Perks of being a wallflower soundtrack here. Because there was another song that played during the uh, the party scene, which really uh, elevated a few things. Let me see. Because I, I know I'm going to recognize. Oh, come on, Eileen. I definitely, I grew oh, up with yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Low by Cracker. Song. That That's the song I'm thinking about. Yeah. I remember I remember that. This movie has a lot of layers. Let's talk about Logan Lerman here for a minute, you know? Um yeah. because um he of course is a central character oh, and yeah. he has these blackouts. Yeah. And he you get these flashbacks of things he can't quite piece together yeah. from his past. And the, the script had a lot more of that kind of thing in it. In fact, the, oh, what's the name of the character? The one who's committed suicide before the book ever starts. Um, Logan's, you know, Charlie's friend. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Michael? Is it Michael? I can't remember. Anyway, he was in the film. All his scenes got cut. At least I survived. <laughs> I'm still in the film. There was a, can you imagine? There was a young man, he got cast in this role and he's doing all these flashback scenes with Charlie and the character that Julia Garner, the awesome Julia Garner, my God, she's so great. I've loving, I'm loving everything she's been doing <laughs> since then, Ozark and that Anna Sorokin thing, uh, Inventing Anna, is that what it was called? She's wonderful. Um, she, her part was bigger because she's supposed to have dated Charlie. I mean, there, there's, both, there's all the stuff and it was all cut. Um, so they but they do have flashbacks in there and it is supposed to be I, I think the way that Stephen tells the story is very very good you don't need all the flat you know I'm sorry Julia and this boy I think his name was Owen who lost his uh, role uh, I'm sorry for them but uh, the way the story unfolds you really don't know is Charlie just like is he schizophrenic you know is there something wrong with this kid that he's not able to function normally what is the deal and in the book it's way at the end and you know pretty much of the film too you find out why he's blacking out and why he's having emotional problems and I just remember thinking oh my god how do you get over something like that <clears throat> how don't yeah how do you get I mean we could talk about it, but I kind of don't want to because I, if anyone hasn't <laughs> seen yeah, it, I don't want to give spoil. Wanna, I don't want to spoil yeah. it. I don't want to tell you why Charlie is the way he is, but it is completely justified. Um, there, there's Melanie, a great there's, moment there's that wonderful. ties into these characters because, of course, Ezra Miller's character, of course, is a uh, closet homosexual who's involved with the the head of the football team. And, of course, the guy from the football team, you know, his father would not approve, you know, and oh. and uh, no, this Ezra and that. Ezra has cool parents, but he, the boyfriend does not. Yeah, <clears throat> so there's that. And then, of course, there's uh, Emma Watson, who's uh, um, involved, uh, well, takes in uh, Logan Lerman. I find the dynamic between these three characters was really interesting, especially when Logan and uh, Ezra got better connected, you know, because it was, yeah, yeah it was yeah. interesting. See, what's, the cool here, it, it, what's cool here, it's like you would wonder from the outside, why would two seniors worry about this freshman kid? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the thing is, these are two seniors who have already been through the ringer. And they've made, well, in, in Sam's case, some bad choices because she didn't value herself. Her parents were divorced and apparently her dad was a real jerk. Uh, her mom was the coolest. Yep. Of course she <laughs> and, was. Um, Patrick's dad was cool, but his parents were divorced and his mom was evidently awful. So, I mean, I don't know if Ezra as Patrick decided, okay, like, was my mom homophobic? What, you know, I don't know what the choices were that Patrick, 
uh, for, you know, that Ezra made on Patrick's behalf or what Stephen had to say about it. But um, I think that they now know that they're lucky because they're in a home where their parents love them and are involved, even though you wouldn't see it. I mean, we were supposed to be at graduation. In fact, as I'm leaving set my, my second day, Ezra came over and, and I, I said, I'm, I'm coming to say goodbye. And he said, no, no, I'm going to see you. Remember graduation? And I said, no, scenes changed. We're not there. And he said, what do you mean you're not there? I said, the parents aren't at graduation. I, I mean, if you watch it, you'll see Kate Walsh, walk, Walsh walking up the bleachers. So she that's supposed to like make a nod to the parents are there. But there was this whole scene of all of us posing with each other's kids. Cause like Charlie, who now I love Charlie and we're, we're having pictures with each other's children. Like you do when you're at your kid's graduation you get pictures of them with their friends and the parents all smiling. And I said, no, it's just you guys running up and down the bleachers now. And he, he, Ezra went over to the producers and said, do you mean to tell me that my parents don't come to my high school graduation? Yeah. <laughs> They but. were a little bit angry about that. And, and he's not wrong because like emotionally that made sense. This is someone, Patrick is a boy who went through a hard time, is still going through a hard time because his boyfriend won't acknowledge their relationship publicly. And he, I think Patrick, I think he's ready to acknowledge it, but not the boyfriend. And um, so life's hard and you've got this family here that cares about you so sam and patrick now know that they're going to be okay and they look at charlie and they see someone who is not okay and just pay it forward sort of uh, an attitude we want to protect this kid we want to get to know this kid and uh, logan logan's very friendly but a, a part of his acting process he he played it like sort of like on the spectrum Mm -hmm. like a some, somewhat autistic so like I remember once he was sitting on the front porch of the house and I was walking into the house and I just said something like you know oh did you have a good weekend and he said yeah and then went back to sort of staring down at the flowers like he's putting himself in this zone where he doesn't connect well with people so mm -hmm. he was friendly but and, and so I thought oh this is how he works so I just you know went on by uh, Logan's very good in that, and he's very good in that film. And he played, he successfully played younger because I don't think he was. He, he well, I'm going to tell him. you, there's a moment in the film where uh, Ezra Miller is being bullied and uh, he gets up. This scene was powerful, you know, because suddenly it's the blackout and you get the flashes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, he's standing there with his knuckles that are all bruised up. And you've got some of these uh, jockey kids that he laid into. And it's like, where did this come from? You know? Right. Well, and you know, he has to black out because violence and, you know, rape, molestation, all that stuff, that's violence. And mm -hmm. anything that is connected, to it, he Charlie can't cope because he hasn't faced his own demons. And um, that scene, it, it kind of announced to everybody that something's up with this guy. <laughs> you know, the, if, if, if you didn't know until that moment, you certainly knew after that moment that this is not just some kid who's moody and difficult. There's something really serious going on here. Um, and I'd like to think that in if if the book don't make a sequel <laughs> but if if there was a sequel um that charlie's doing well now that even the scene at the party where emma watson makes the milkshake you know the way ezra and uh emma look at him you know and of course he of course is stoned because somebody gave him the <laughs> But they're, but they're looking at him a little differently and I, I i i'm like okay 
you know it's like they're looking at him like an endangered species you know right they're, they're, they've adopted a certain parental quality about him and it, it's a bit of a divide because emma also is a bit sweet on him but it's like or sam is a bit sweet on him so it's you know there, there's a couple things going on there but uh both sam and patrick could be very nurturing toward Charlie, which he, and you know, his parents wanted to be too. And we don't realize until nearly the end why he can't really go to them um, because that's a little bit too close to home. Yeah. But the friends can connect with him better, which is why my librarian friend <laughs> wanted to loan this book out to certain kids because sometimes it is your peer group that will save you. It just depends on who's in that peer group. They've got to be yep. the right people. But Sam and Patrick were definitely the right people. But even <clears throat> Logan's home life, like I love the relationship he had uh, with his sister and yeah. sister with um, – ponytail um oh what what's ponytail the, derek ponytail jerry you know? was, i mean can you believe do you watch succession oh my god i got my money on nicholas braun winning succession that's i you heard it here first yeah but <laughs> my i money's mean on him. oh he, he was great in the movie great. and um who is it? Nina Dubrov that played the sister. Nina Dubrov, and... yeah. She she played Candace. Is that her name? I think. Candace yeah. I love that dynamic. You know, like I mm -hmm. love it when she gets this phone call and she's like, you know, she knows something's up, you know, and uh, wow. And there's other yeah because you know siblings can be really competitive and you act like they hate each other and but in a moment of crisis that's who's there for you like wait a minute this is i'm not going to i'm not going to beat them up this time there's something happening here and the it it's it's interesting how then this also showed layers of the sibling and <clears throat> i don't know i don't remember from the original script how much more charlie's parents were in the film than they ended up being because <laughs> it's like I said, you know, you would think these kids don't have families. Um, but uh, I mean, they're still in there because they have to be that their, uh, their role is, is very important in how things unfold for Charlie. Mm -hmm. You have some, um, there's some roles in here, too, that also stand out. <laughs> Paul Rudd as the English teacher, for example, mm -hmm. great in this movie. I had a good connection with my English teacher in high school, who was also an so. author. Yeah. <clears throat> I did, too. And, and I wonder, I, I, you know, it's funny because my daughter's degree, her university degree is in English creative writing. And she always got along really well with her English teachers, too. And I... I, I I've wondered since I was in school and I was a good writer, is it because we found a kindred spirit? Uh, because a lot of people say that was their least favorite teacher. <laughs> in fact, when my daughter graduated, <clears throat> I was all proud of her, of course, because she had just gotten her degree. And she said, ah, it's just English. And I said, excuse me, honey, think of all your friends, her friends at college, engineering, pre-vet, astronomy, whatever. I said, what did they say? Math. There's one of the guys, his, his major was math. What did they say was their hardest class? Oh, the English class they had to take for their general education requirements. And that was the only English they took. And I said, yeah, to them, that was the hardest class they took. You're thinking, oh, engineering, math. No, they're thinking English. Ah. <laughs> so I think if you've got that connection there, which clearly Charlie and uh, I forgot the teacher's name, but Paul, Paul Rudd. They, well, Paul Rudd's is really Paul Rudd, the I mean, actor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the character, um, they they clicked right away. And I think sometimes those teachers can tell. Yeah, this Mr. Anderson, really that's who he played. Mr. Yeah. Anderson. Yeah. Well, when I was in high school, I had an English teacher recommend John Steinbeck to me. He couldn't have been more right. I plowed through everything Steinbeck wrote. And it was funny because it was based on one conversation I had with the teacher. And he just thought, this is going to light a fire under her. And it sure did. 
Um, the only English teacher I didn't really like, interesting enough, was at university. I went to Northwestern. Mm -hmm. And granted, Northwestern's a tough school. I mean, their acceptance rate is like less than 10%. It's a hard school, but this is just freshman English. So I wouldn't have, and I could write. So I thought this isn't going to be that bad. <clears throat> but the, what the teacher liked and what I liked didn't connect. And so this person kept recommending the wrong books. And I was bored out of my mind and I'd write my paper and I'd pass, but it wasn't great. And then the teacher recommended, it was Twain. It was a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. I loved that book. And I wrote my paper and I got it back and it said, A, I always knew you had it in you. <laughs> I couldn't get an A until that moment because we didn't click. But for me, then seeing Charlie click with Mr. Anderson, I thought, I know that. I know that. I know when that's happened, and I've known when that hasn't happened. But when that happens, man, that's magic. That is so important for a kid. And I wish I had thought to ask Stephen that. D did that happen to you when you were in school? Did you click with your English teacher? And that kind of led you down this path where you became this successful author and screenplay writer and and and, and even marry an author. <laughs> it's a writing family. Absolutely. But, and Mae Whitman was also really good in this too, as the yes, the girl yes. that's um, trying to connect with uh, Charlie romantically, and it's just no. I mean, obviously, you know, Logan got to kiss. Uh, Emma Watson, you know, I mean, how can you forget that? But <laughs> Emma says she can't watch that scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Mae Whitman, you know, um, not connecting. And um, I've seen her like she was in um, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. She's a yeah. firecracker. <laughs> She's very good. And, you know, and the way she played that character, I mean, we've all been there. We have all liked someone who did not like us back. I mean, it's just, it's like, oh, honey, turn your attention to somebody else. He's not, it's not going to happen. You got to give up, <laughs> move on. And, but it's hard to do, especially when you're young. It's really, because you're, you're just learning about all of this. You're the, you know, the emotional love life, your brain. Isn't... And how she finds out. During... <laughs> you're, it's like your, your lobes haven't connected yet. So you can't even read that little it. game they were playing. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I got to bring this up too, because it was so funny. I did not see this coming. But when I saw it, it's like, what is he doing in this film? I think it's because it was shot in Pittsburgh. But Tom Savini plays the shop oh. teacher. Yeah. And it's I funny think, because yeah. he's I think known. it is because it was shot in Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah he's known as uh, an effects artist. And uh, he does a lot of gore effects. He did Friday the 13th. He did Friday the 13th part four, the final chapter. He did Creep Show. He did, um, oh, the cow, I could go on. Dawn of the Dead, you know. All these uh, effects and uh, go a lot of gore movies. And yeah, here he is playing the shop teacher. And I'm like, what's he doing in this movie? But I gotta admit, I'm glad to see him because those were some of the funniest scenes in the movie. I love yeah, the it's scene. Sort of, it's sort of an in-joke, you know, because if you didn't know who he was, you wouldn't know. But Stephen knew who he was, so he stuck him in there. I love the scene where, because uh, Ezra's character keeps messing with him and uh, goes in there, he sees this clock and it's just turned the other way. And Tom Savini looks at him and goes, really? And he goes, if you fail me, you got me next year. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick is such a great character. Such a great character. I mean, those kids had so much fun. We were all kept at this one hotel and they uh, would have connecting rooms. And so it was kind of like, for them, it was like a dorm. I, I mean, my room, we didn't connect my room to anybody, but I mean, it was, it was just fun for them to have this, this experience because them being 
well known, this was as close to most kids' high school experiences they were ever going to have. And so I think it was really sweet for them to have that. Um, and, you know, act like you're being like a normal kid in a normal high school and to do those scenes. It's, it's, it was a fantasy for them. Okay. Where, you know, for most kids, being at Hogwarts would be the fantasy, but that there was actually more, more the reality for Emma. That was that had, is a huge chunk of her childhood. And then getting to be like this American high school student and having your friends and hanging out and stuff like that, that's pretty cool. Were you familiar with Savini's work outside Perks? No? Not really. I mean, the effects stuff I was kind of aware of. I did a movie 40 years ago. I think when we were talking before this, I said, this must be anniversary month because I just did a podcast with someone for a movie I did 40 years ago mm -hmm. where my severed head is found. And um, so I was, it wasn't him. It wasn't Tom who did this, but I did a, you know, where they stick the straws up your nose and they do the plaster cast. And I had to have yep. that. Um, dead look on my face and and then they peel that off and then they use that to make and it was very very weird to show up then on location and look straight into my own dead face <laughs> and severed <laughs> but so I mean I don't know if it was because of that that I kind of paid attention a little bit to that kind of stuff the people who do that artistry because it really is an art I mean it, it, and the guys who did, I can't remember their names. It was two guys and they had this apartment in LA. It was so funny because I showed up. They, I don't know if either one of them lived there. They might not have. I think it was just where they had their place of business in an apartment and you walk in and it is just like heads everywhere and mm -hmm. body parts. And, and it's just, ah, this is your home. Please tell me no, tell me you live somewhere else. But it was certainly where they worked. Um, it was really cool because from the outside, you would just think it was an ordinary apartment building, but one of the units in there is Creek Town. And so I, got, I was kind of interested because of my own personal experience with doing that. But I didn't really, I, and I didn't meet him because all this, anybody I met was at the house. I wasn't in the other scenes where I would meet the other yeah. people. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you when I saw him, it was like, is there going to be a massacre here or something you know and it, like no. but i i heard somebody told me that he was in pittsburgh that's where savini's yeah from, so. yeah i think he's local yeah i mean i'm well, considered local i'm not i had to drive two and a half hours to get there but it's it's considered local casting because they didn't have to fly me in from somewhere now i'm about to do a convention called frightmare in the falls and niagara falls and and uh, Savini was supposed to be one of the people there, but he had ended up postponing. So, uh, <laughs> oh, well, well, he's a little busy, so who knows? Yeah, but um, he does some incredible work, I'll tell you that. But it was really cool seeing him in this movie. I gotta say, I'm glad he was in it, you know. So, kudos to him. If I ever meet him, I'm going to ask him about perks of being a wallflower, you know, because I'm, 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 <laughs> I'd be surprised if he gets many questions about that. But Well, I don't know. I, I don't know what the, it's like concentric circles, the Venn diagram, the people who knew him anyway, and mm -hmm. then saw perks. So, because those are very different genres for sure. Yeah. And of course, you know, the director. We gotta talk about uh, Stephen. I'm gonna botch his last name. Spassky. Okay, because you got a lot of letters not a, there. Not a heck of a lot of vowels. Spassky. Yeah. Well, my last name is Rude and Scott. I mean, you don't hear that every day. No. In fact, when I first started in the business, somebody was asking me, "Are you gonna change your name?" And I, I thought about it, and I said, "No. You know what?" It's just two syllables. It's just six letters. N Scott. It's not that hard. And once people know it, they know it. Although once when they don't know it, it's so funny. So when I was in LA and I would have auditions at like Paramount or, you know, Fox or wherever, and where they have the gate <clears throat> and you come up and they've got your name on a list because you're expected. They need you to come in either because you're on a shoot or you're there for an audition. And, um, so I would come up and they'd say, oh, what's your name? Jennifer N. Scott, E-N-S-K-A-T. I don't see it. 
look under S for Jennifer Ann Scott. <laughs> And sure enough, it would be there every time. And my agent said, I spelled it for them. And I said, they don't listen. People don't listen. They think they heard Jennifer Ann Scott and it's Jennifer N. Scott, N, N, they're not the same, but they would write Jennifer Ann Scott. But it was funny because um, I was nearly on, do you remember Happy Days? Yeah, they, oh they yeah. So I almost married Potsy. They ended up not marrying Potsy off, but I was, I was, very nearly on a uh, regular on that show. And so by the time I was at my like fourth audition coming into Paramount, I drove up and the guy goes, I know, and Scott with an E, <laughs> he just let me in. So I thought, see, I'm not wrong. Once people learn the name, they do not mix me up with anybody else. And even though there aren't very many women named Jennifer in my age group, you go down 20 years, it was the number one name forever and ever and ever. So if I had a more common last name, it would be easier for me to get lost in the shuffle. So yep. I'm not complaining that there aren't that many of us out there with my name. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Silver lining after all. huh? <laughs> there always is one. If you look for it, you'll find it. Absolutely. But um, how, I mean, he, this guy directed the film and he wrote the book, um, which is really interesting, you know, and he did a, uh, a great job with this movie. But did he have a – I don't know if you know this, but how difficult was it for him to translate this to screen or was it simpler? How did he process what he wanted to kept, keep in and what he wanted to put on the screen? Well, all I'm aware of evolve. is, I mean, a lot of that, obviously, I couldn't answer, but the, the only things I'm aware of is he was an author first, mm -hmm. and then he wrote the screenplay for it, and he did have a cast kind of tentatively in mind, and in fact, the young man who was going to play Patrick passed away, I can't remember his name, and the whole thing fell apart, and he was, uh, Stephen was having trouble marketing this to get it made, and then suddenly, Emma Watson expressed interest, and Stephen's like, it's going to get made now. There's not going yep. to be any trouble getting this made now. And so then it was completely recast from everybody he had had in mind. And um, um, now, like I said before, when you're a director, Stephen had directed before. He directed the film version of Rent. And he had directed yep. a TV show, uh, Jericho, I think it was called. So he had some directing actual experience. I don't know. Maybe he had studied it, too. I really don't know that much about his background. So it wasn't like he was a total unknown. But when you've got Emma Watson on board, you're not going to run into a lot of roadblocks. And I think that made all the difference in the world. And so Mr. Mudd was the uh, like hands-on producers. So a lot of people don't understand what producers do. They think they just write checks. Almost always, that's not what a producer is doing. <laughs> Almost always they're making the project happen. I'm a producer now too. And there will be times where we're getting ready to shoot a scene and then the weather report isn't good and we're gonna shoot at night at outdoors and we're worried, uh-oh, what about the rain? So, okay, let's swap out instead because this is an interior. Let's shoot this that day. We'll shoot that next Tuesday. Oh, wait a minute. That actor who's already established as being in the film isn't available that day because he's already booked on something else. Okay, that's not gonna work. We're the ones making sure, it, did you handle the catering? Did, you, did we get the permits? Did we, whatever. So we are ultimately the boss. The director is the one who's going to get most of the accolades because that's gonna be the name you hear and the person, the face of it in mm -hmm. interviews. You know, you're gonna have the director there and on set when you're shooting, that is the boss. But like I said, they have to answer to somebody. And they got, I had misquoted once and said it was Lionsgate. It wasn't Lionsgate. They had Summit Entertainment was the big producer. So you had Mr. Mudd um, making sure that a lot of the little details got handled. And above them is Summit. And Summit has vast experience. And so they're going to say, yes, okay, this package comes with this author, screenwriter as the director not totally inexperienced, so this is fine. We're gonna allow this, but we're gonna make some other changes because after all, we're paying for it. <clears throat> and so, you know, he didn't always get what he wanted, but he, he definitely got a lot of what he wanted. His process on set was awesome. And, and this has become more and more common over time, wanting actors to ad-lib scenes. 
So mm-hmm. like, as you know, most of my scenes got cut. I have this scene where you actually do hear me talking, thank God, or you would never hear me talk in the whole movie. And it's when the kids are going away to college. And Steven's telling me, just say stuff. Because there was nothing written. He hadn't written anything. So we're all, it's the goodbyes and all that. Nothing is written. So I, <laughs> I said, um, come on, Sam because she's taking too long chatting with her friends. Because so there again is that parental steal. Come on, Sam, we gotta go. Put your seatbelts on, I say to the kids as they're getting in the truck. And afterwards, Stephen goes, would you really tell your kids that age to put their seatbelts on? And I said, I do. <laughs> I uh. tell my kids to put their seatbelts on. <laughs> and so he left it in. Um, but that process, that like letting the actor just go and do what feels right um, in that moment, I think it's a wonderful gift because we don't always get it. You're working with a script, but you can move off it if if you're if the spirit tells you move off it. They can always reel you back in and say, no, we don't want we don't want to introduce that idea, so we need to back off because it's not going to fit with what is coming up next. He's in charge, but. Um, I loved that kind of freedom for us to just sort of, if if, if then the film comes off that much more generic, you know, as we're walking from the house, I'm still in that bit with, um, they're on their way to homecoming, Mm -hmm. you know, and Charlie's got a camera and the guy who's playing my husband is shooting it and the parents would, and we're just walking and talking. Now you don't really hear us because I think you're hearing Charlie's uh, monologue over Mm -hmm. and all, but we're just acting like you would act in that scenario. He really didn't tell us what to do. Everybody just knew who their characters were and did what their characters would do. And it's really nice. Uh, I've been on shoots where I was micromanaged, like right down to the inch of where to tilt my head and move. And my job in that case is to make it appear natural, but it's less likely to come across as natural if it isn't generic. So I really did like Stephen's process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how many arguments he got into with Summit. He, I can tell you, he got into so many, he lost them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He may have won others. I, I don't know. He may have won others. I hope so. I mean, he won getting to direct the film. That meant everything to him. So yep. uh, you can't complain about that. And of course, Melanie Linsky was in this as well, and uh, a key part. And uh, yeah, and she was really good as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this movie was terrific, and uh, and at some point too, I um, uh, was it uh, I'm uh, blanking on the last name of the the girl that you know, um, Aaron. Well, help me, Aaron. Well, help me. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to have her come on here and talk about this at some point too. But uh, but nonetheless, you know, did one last question I have about perks? Did you go to the premiere? Um, the one in Pittsburgh. So the actual premiere premiere was at uh, the Toronto Film Festival, mm-hmm. and I didn't go to that one. But in fact, my copy of the book, the one that I bought, that Stephen signed says, wait, you were such a delight to work with and such an incredible pro. It meant the world to me. See you at the Pittsburgh premiere. And he did. Yeah. And then, like I said, we were, we were, I was at the event for Liz's book and he goes to give me, I said, Stephen, I have one. You already signed it. He goes, I'm going to sign you another one. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so I have two copies if anybody needs to borrow one, but you got to give it back because he wrote, a note to me in it <laughs> there you go yeah those are keepers he's the now, nicest guy in the world he's so sweet yeah we gotta talk about zach and marie make a porno because i saw that in the theater too and i love the title <laughs> zach and marie make yeah, a porno I, I heard that kevin smith got that film sold on the strength of the title they hadn't even seen a script he hadn't written the script yet nothing it just the the title itself sold the film Mm -hmm. um yeah um i can talk about that i it's it's actually really a a pretty good story so there is a sequence in that film and the entire sequence is on excuse me i'm 
Oh, I've got, <coughs> I have a little problem here. <coughs> I think I got it. Water. I'm going to have some more, well, it, water won't fix everything. But just some medical junk. Anyway, uh, it's not COVID, I'm happy to say. So um, there's the sequence. If you want to see the whole thing, it's on the deleted scenes, which you can easily find on the internet now. And it is a scene of a bunch of idiots. <laughs> of idiot actors so he's he's kevin's actually having a little fun poking fun at actors um it's like we had just come off doing some community theater production of our town and we we are thinking we're auditioning for the next great thing and we're actually auditioning for a pornographic film so his instructions that we got through our agents was enter the audition room as a character create a character which it's a hundred percent up to us create a character that would never in a million years be cast in a porno and come in as that character and then the casting director is going to kind of do a scene with you giving you the lines and you read the lines and just have fun with it and you know so he, he wanted to see a whole performance around this concept so because I had always played the girl next door, and then when I got a little older, the mom of the girl next door, and this is, this is before perks. So, you know, I, the, the kids just keep getting older, but I keep playing that same person. Mm -hmm. um, I knew where to go with this. So I flat ironed my hair poker straight. I put a little bobby pin right here. I put on these little wire rim glasses, a little Peter Pan collar. And I played this very nerdy lady who was just so excited. And I went in and I said, hi. And they hand me the script and I said, oh, woman. I, I played woman in a play. I know this character, I can play this. Okay, and then I start reading these lines and it was a list of like 15 progressively more disgusting <laughs> sentences and i'm reading them like i don't know what they mean i don't know what any of this is i'm so naive that i just i'm giving it my all and uh, apparently Stephen really, uh, Stephen, I'm still talking on Shaposky. Kevin Smith really liked it. So he cast, I don't know, maybe a dozen of us. Something, I don't remember how many of us he cast. So the shoot was at, it, it was at McKittrick, Pennsylvania, it's suburban Pittsburgh. So it, 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 it this, it's at a little theater and they had the set there. And so we would come out one at a time and do the same thing. So that's what each one of us did. He was actually going to write the scene in post-production. Each one of us went out and did exactly what we had done at the audition. Like it's the, like we are the whole scene, knowing full well he's going to chop this thing up. And I finished. <clears throat> and he starts laughing. And I knew he had an idea. And he goes, OK, read this particular sentence one more time and then say, it felt good to say that. <laughs> just said oh my god and of course it was the grossest sentence of all of them and I, I said Kevin you don't know my son is in your target audience <laughs> he's got to see this he liked that especially he loved that and I said all right all right <clears throat> so I did it and then he goes you tell your son for me his mom's cool and I said, oh, Kevin, my son thinks you're the coolest guy on the face of the earth. He goes, no, 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 no. You tell your son that his mom is cooler than I am. So <laughs> we had this great little exchange. So then I get in my car and I'm driving home and I called him. I said, hey, honey, Kevin Smith has a message for you. What? <laughs> he wants you to know that your mom is cooler than he is and there's this silence for kind of a long time and then he goes no you're not <laughs> <He's wrong. laughs> so to this day he insists i'm not cooler than kevin smith but uh i've got it on good authority that i am <laughs> have you seen any of kevin's uh, films prior to this yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I was called back on Dogma. Um, wow. The, it's, yeah. And, and the reason why that ended up not working out, it was, it was kind of interesting. I think he made the right choice. So um, I'm very waspy looking. And um, so it was the part that Janine Garofalo played. So, okay. Uh, 
yeah, and he wasn't initially thinking that direction at all. And the lead, you know, she's um, Catholic and she's got all this anxiety, you know, her, the Catholic guilt. And so there's a real kind of like the religious theme, the battle within her. Yeah. And then the person she's working with at this Planned Parenthood type place to also be kind of similar to that, although I come across wasp would which would indicate protestants where we have somewhat less guilt but still it's he thought no i want to go way different so i actually i went to my callback and i did the scene that you see in the film and i was asked to wait so i waited i i hung out in pittsburgh for hours with another woman who was also called back and asked to wait and finally it was getting late and we thought i don't want to drive home we had she had an even farther drive she lived in cincinnati and we were in pittsburgh so we said let's get a hotel room <laughs> so we go and book a hotel room and we're getting ready to sleep the night because we're thinking we're asked to wait is he going to want us to cut the cast director saying he might want you to come back he might you know we don't know well what was happening was he was thinking it over and deciding what he wanted to do with this role and he decided he wanted to go maybe jewish something you know like way different <clears throat> so then we get the call that like no he's going a different way completely so yeah i mean i love dogma I mean, I like Zack and Mary Make a Porno. I think it's a cute film. I think Dogma is just brilliant. That's my favorite film of his. My favorite film of his is Clerks and Clerks 2. I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> That's yeah, usually I've had a couple of interviews it. from Clerks, so yeah. But um, I, I saw I Dogma know. in the theater. What? What is his name? I'm going to have to look it up. Um, from He's in almost all of Kevin's movies. In fact, we were talking about this. Because here he was in almost all of kevin's movies except the one that i was in that's why we were laughing about that oh brian um, o'halloran brian o'halloran that's it it yeah. was brian o'halloran we met at a film festival and we were talking about this because of course he's so identified with with his connection dante to kevin. And, well he wasn't yeah, supposed I, to be there today <laughs> Today? That's his. What? That's his. That's his line. Oh, oh, oh right, 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 right. Supposed right. to be here today. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, yeah. So Brian, you know, it's funny because we're talking and he's so identified with that. And and I said, you know, I think the one Kevin Smith movie you're not in is the one I was in. <laughs> so we were, you know, so we had never met before until that film festival. Yeah, yeah. Where I had a project win, by the way. So. There you go. There yes. you go. Well, poor uh, Jeff Anderson, who played Randall in the Clerks film, he was in Zach and Marie, and he had an unfortunate incident when he was filming a certain way. Oh, oh I know. The film's really gross. It really is gross. But I mean, <laughs> that's why I'm saying it appeals to a certain audience. Yeah. Um, which I am not the target audience. But, you know, it, it, what happened then afterwards, so he, Kevin put that scene together in post, and he loved my nerdy puritanical loser uh, so much that he made, I'm the butt of the joke. It's, it's all these people and you go along and you go along and you go along and then you got me. And then, then it goes away and you just have the empty stage. And then the young guy comes on who they end up casting. Um, <clears throat> that's how he edited the scene. And it's really good. And that's why I say it's out there. You can see it. But then the film was too long. And so it was the distributor or whoever, I don't remember who it was, somebody, somebody on the production end, because again, he's the director, but that doesn't mean he has the last word on everything. And they cut it down because they, they thought it was too long. So they only used the first few of the idiot actors and then the rest got cut. So actually it's like his joke went away. I think it would have made more sense if they had cut out the first half and kept the second half because it built to a thing that is now gone. And, and that's kind of a shame, but that was not his, his doing. <clears throat> but, you know, still, I've got, I've, I've got the clip on my reel. I just bleep myself out. <laughs> I made my reel a little bit more G-rated. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Did you get to meet um, Seth Rogen or Elizabeth Banks? 
Yeah, both of them, but not well. So like they were in that scene, but that was shot as a reversal. So mm -hmm. we weren't in that room at the same time. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth and I had a stellar conversation. I was walking toward the production trailer. She was coming out. She said, hi. And I said, hi. The end. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> now, Seth Rogen, that was more funny. So <clears throat> a friend of mine, another actor out of Cleveland, was also there. She was also cast doing the same bit with me. And um, we're sitting, I think it was when we were having dinner. And so we're in this big room with lots of long tables eating. And Seth was nearby and um, she said, oh, wait, I gotta go talk to, this was so funny. <laughs> I can't believe she had that. She goes, I need to go talk to Seth, hang on. I said, you're just gonna accost this man. Maybe he doesn't wanna be bothered. But she went up and she stuck her hand out and she goes, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm Kat, I'm playing uh, Mary, I'm your co-star. <laughs> so and he, he, he was great, he just laughed. He thought it was really funny and charming that she came up and introduced herself that way, which she clearly was not Elizabeth Banks. But I mean, <laughs> he was just, he just chatted a little bit with people and then went on. But um, so we met, but we didn't really get to know each other because generally it was that group of idiot actors. We were kind of hanging out in one place waiting and they would come in and say, okay, the next one, the next one. We all were doing essentially the same scene, waiting to see how he was gonna carve it up. And I don't know if he ended up using all of us who were there. It seemed like there were a lot of us there, maybe more than actually got used in his edit. But um, I had a feeling I was definitely going to make that cut because when he came up with this idea for me, it kind of set it apart based on this weird, weird woman. <laughs> it was just nice for me to get to show my uh, character chops because I did spend most of my career being the nice all-American girl next door, which was a, a very popular character. So it, it allowed me to work a fair amount. The thing is that you know, as an actor, you want to be able to do other things than that same role over and over. And once I hit middle age and suddenly uh, the roles got more interesting, I might be the nice lady next door, but she's the nice lady next door who's an alcoholic. You know, there's something there that makes the character more layered and more interesting to play. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I just look into the credits of Zach and Marie make a porno. I for, totally forgot about this because it's been a while since I've seen the film. Friggin' Tom Savini's in that too. <laughs> yeah, he's in that too. But again, Pittsburgh. I think that I that's guess. Like, if you do a stunt casting, if you're in Pittsburgh, you can get Tom Savini to come in and play a role. And, you know, he'd be happy to. There <laughs> Obviously. You go. He, Obviously. I don't think he says, I don't think he says no. <laughs> you mentioned um, 40 years ago, an anniversary, and I was looking your credits up and, um, I'm, I'm assuming you were interviewed about Blood Song. I was. I have yeah. not seen that film, so you're going to whet my appetite for it because I, <laughs> I, I love Song. these movies. Blood Song was hard to get a hold of. I think it exists out there like in YouTube land, but um, I think the reason why, so this was back at Halloween had come out. I don't even think Halloween 2 yet. I mean, you know, this was early in the horror movie of the 80s era. Mm -hmm. And um, so Frankie Avalon, who anyone who knows who he is would know. Yep. Him. Well, it depends on your age. Beach Blanket Bingo with Annette Funicello from way, way, way back in the day. But then later, like Beauty School Dropout from uh, Greece. You know, um, Greece. And uh, I mean, so he's always, same thing I was talking about. He was always playing this nice guy. Uh, and he is a nice guy. He's a very nice guy. But he wanted to play a part that was a huge departure. And in this, he is a homicidal maniac. He's an ex-murderer. And so he, he gets this role in uh, this movie, Blood Song. And it's produced by, I can't remember who all, but Lenny Montana was the producer who was like on set, the one that we all related to. So if you saw The Godfather, Lenny Montana played uh, Luca Brazzi, the one who gets stabbed in the hand and Luca Brazzi swims with the fishes, that guy. Okay. Um, and um, he, was a, he was in Blood Song, but he also was a producer of the film. So I got cast to play, I'm one of the victims um, back in the eighties. Of course, you have to have a young female vulnerable victim. And I have that vulnerable thing too, like I was talking about with Ezra. I, it, it just shows up when I, <laughs> 
you should walk into the room. I can take advantage of her. Little do they know, but they think they can. Um, so I got cast in the role of Judith and it was a decent supporting role. And I have some great memories of that shoot. But again, this touches on this whole fame thing. So Coos Bay, Oregon is a small coastal town in Oregon. Lots of woods, lots of lumber mills, stuff like that. Small town atmosphere, really friendly people. They knew we were coming, holy smokes. So we arrive. I remember I was on a jet getting me from Seattle out to Coos, I think Seattle where I was, out to Coos Bay. Walter Mondale was on this small jet with me and Noel North, who's also in the film. He was campaigning for president. This was just before the presidential election. He was the candidate opposite Reagan. And um, that was our plane to go out there. We were really late leaving because they had to do background checks on Noel and me before they would let us on this small plane with the presidential candidate. And uh, so we get out to Coos Bay and we arrive and there's a whole lot of people there at the airport. And I assumed they were there because of Mondale. And I think some of them were, but then they whisk him away and the people stayed. They weren't there because of Mondale. They knew every single one of us in the cast and they knew us by name. It was the weirdest week in my life. I come from nobody knowing who I am to me walking down the street and people yelling out their cars, Jennifer, hi. It was bizarre. I, I Everywhere we went, people wanted autographs. We were, it, it, I've never, and in fact, this one day, I arrived like 7 a.m. was my call time and I'm there on location and we have the trailer that's divided up into the little dressing rooms, the honey wagon, and I've got yep. mine. Yeah, so I have my clothes in there and it's like jeans, sloppy old shoes, nothing fancy. And I put on my wardrobe and then I come out and we go into the building where we're shooting and it's raining. And there are people there behind a barrier wanting to see us all. And I thought, it's 7 a.m. and you guys are out here already. That's weird. So we're in there for most of the day. I mean, the morning. And then we come out for lunch. They have lunch set up under a tent. And it was Frankie and me and um, the crew. So we're, they, they have umbrellas over Frankie and me. They want to make sure we don't get wet. So we go over to the tent. And I notice at that point, there's way more people. The, the people that I saw at 7 a.m. haven't left. And it's now noon. And it's a crowd. So we go and we eat lunch. And then as we're coming back, the director, Alan Levy, he's like holding the door open. And I said, hey, Alan, would it be all right if Frankie and I go over there and talk to the people for a little bit? Because they've been they're, they've been standing in the rain for hours. It just seems like we should. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come out and get you if, if you know when I need you, if you don't work your way through the whole crowd yet. So we went over and people had pens and we're signing autographs. And, do, and I just thought, why do you want mine? I, and, and then I see, I look over and in front of the honey wagon, there's a man standing in front of my dressing room, one of the production assistants. And I said, why are you in front of my dressing room? And he said, oh, we caught someone trying to steal your shoes. My shoes, my old beat up gardening shoes. Why would you care? I, I, I had never had an experience like that before. So the weekends, um, I go home and nobody knows who I am. <laughs> It was actually pretty awesome because then I could go back to having a normal life. But um, that shoot, we had a marvelous, marvelous family atmosphere there in Oregon. The people were really friendly. So they were extremely curious about us, but they weren't intrusive except for the one guy wanting to steal my shoes. I, I think he's got <laughs> some sort of fetish there. But um, I have a very vivid memory. One night I, I was released. Um, and they're worried about the eight hour turnaround because the union has to give me eight hours off so I can go and get some sleep. But I didn't want to leave because we're having such a good time while they're setting up the next shot. So they had this car that had, we're all in the back seat and they had a bench seat for the front seat. It was an old car, like before bucket seats were there. And it's Noel North, me and Frankie. We're in the back seat. We're slid down like we're low. We got our feet hanging over the bench seat to the front. And either Noel or Frankie started singing Venus. <laughs> Frankie's hit from 1950 something. I don't know when Venus say you will. And I don't really know the words. So I was kind of like, da, 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 you know, singing along. And the windows were down. 
And suddenly there's Lenny Montana, Luca Brazzi. He sticks his head in and he goes, hey, weren't you released? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go soon. But I'm singing Venus with Frankie Avalon. I'm not leaving now. <laughs> so I mean, we just, it was just fun. And Frankie was there with his cousin who he took as an assistant on shoots. And his, his cousin was awesome. He was a really caring guy. He would, he kind of took me at one night. We went really, really late and I was exhausted and I came back. He had thought ahead and gotten me a sandwich. So I would get something to eat if I wanted it before going to bed. And I did. And I ate it and goes, now you need to get some sleep. You go, go. <laughs> Just a sweet man. And he wanted, his great goal in life would have been to own an Italian, an Italian restaurant. And he found out that the restaurant adjacent to the hotel where we, were, where we were staying was closed Sunday evenings. So he got permission to take over the restaurant for that one night. So I remember Alan Levy and this cousin and I, I don't remember who else went to the grocery store, but at least the three of us. And we bought everything he told us to buy. And then he spent the day in the kitchen. He made this vat of sauce, the meatballs and ribs and chicken and all kinds of stuff. I think. I was on like salad duty, something safe where I couldn't get in his way. <laughs> and um, cast and crew, we ate and ate and ate. We had, we had a wonderful time. Stuff like that doesn't happen very often on a, on a shoot, but it, it did on Blood Song and it was great. And then the film came out and it sank like a stone. And I don't know if it's because people didn't want to see Frankie Avalon as an ex murderer. I mean, it starred Donna Wilkes. She was a big deal at the time, Angel. I mean, this she was very famous. Mm -hmm. um, and she's the one who finds my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just, I don't know why it didn't take off other than I'm guessing People don't really want you to play a different part than they're used to seeing you play. I like seeing people play different parts. It's called acting. And I think Frankie did a good job. I, I mm -hmm. thought he was good. So, you know, Judith did not survive to see the end, but that was, you know, that's the horror trope. You have to have a certain number of people die along the way, and one of them has to be a young, pretty girl who was stupidly hitchhiking and got picked up by this guy, and then she's, she has an affair with him, and uh, then she ticks him off, and he kills her, which is yeah. what happened. Yeah. Wow. Um, I wonder if the film's on Blu-ray. I doubt it, because um, once upon a time, many years ago, I went to find it. This was before Blu-ray. Uh, so it was DVD at that time. And I thought I had found it. I saw somebody was selling it on like eBay or something. And I bought a copy and it came. It was a different movie called Blood Song. It was interesting. And it was just an honest mistake on their part. They absolutely gave me my money back. They, Ben Cross made a movie called Blood Song. But the picture they had on their page on eBay was the right one. It was our poster. But then what they had in their stock was the wrong film. It was just the same title. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, and they said, oh, I guess we don't have it. So um, I, I don't really know if it exists on Blu-ray or not, but. <laughs> well, well, at least you know, you had somebody reach out to you about it. So somebody's watch it. I well, haven't heard it. of this film. That, that was so, it, because that was my first question for him, was like, Blood Song? How do you know about Blood Song? I didn't think anybody knew about that one. Yeah. But, but uh, it's certainly a movie I wouldn't mind checking out, because um, I was 10 years old in 1982 when that came out. So that was an era that, um, you know, I'm very familiar with. And, uh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a part of that era, Era the, the slasher movies of the time. Mm -hmm. There was a good 10 years where, I mean, it's not like they don't exist now, but there was a time where that was like the genre out there. And everybody yep. was kind of cashing in. And I didn't do another horror movie until, uh, like I've got one in film festivals now where I, but, they, but here's the switch. I play the killer. This, this nice middle-aged lady next door She's a baddie. And um, I thought, wow, a 40 year gap. <laughs> What's <laughs> this movie called? It, it's called Yes Mother. 
okay. Yeah, that is up here. I, I need to let's switch on to that here. The, the trailer, watch the trailer. I've got the trailer out. Uh -huh. uh, I have to, the movie is not available out because it's screening at film festivals like this. Okay. Movie, it'll be out. Um, but uh, the trailer is available. Well, I'll tell you where you can find it. Um, our production company, leapyearfilms.com. Mm -hmm. The trailer to Yes Mother is on there. And it's creepy. Okay. You don't want to mess sold. with me. <laughs> Now, looking on IMDb, you wear a lot of hats, you know, because uh, I'm seeing on here that you're not just uh, an actress, you're an editor, you're a producer, you're, you got a director, eight credits here, you writer, additional crew, visual effects, sound department. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so when I was at university, I was a theater major at Northwestern, but, you know, you have to take other classes. Your major is just part of what you're doing. And some of them are in other disciplines. You know, you got to take so much math, science, whatever. But then I took production classes just for fun. And I loved it. And what was really interesting to me was when we did editing, I had a knack for it. And editing back then was very different from it was now. We did not have computers. Um, they existed, but they they would they were enormous and you had to learn a foreign language to use them and no one owned one in their home. So to edit, you had to make your decision in your head and then literally cut the film and, and splice it together. And I was just good at it. I was a natural. I could see how things should unfold from the footage that was there. But I never thought I'd do anything with it. I just, it was just information. Um, and I think having studied editing helped make me a better actor because then I understood what editors need. I think anytime you walk a mile in someone else's shoes, it improves overall what it is you're trying to do. And it's just a smart idea anyway. It makes us nicer, nicer people. But um, years go by and um, I met my boyfriend, who is a cinematographer, and he had done some uh, indie productions. He normally didn't do indie work. He worked at a production company for many, many years, but and was a freelancer. Just you know, ha hire me and I'll shoot your thing for you. But um, he had an idea of us doing our own projects, and so I, I didn't have a plan to direct. I didn't have a plan to write. I, I knew I'd be a good producer because I am extremely detail oriented. And to be a good producer, you have to be extremely uh, detail oriented. But I thought, oh, I know how to edit. I'll do that. So we did, um, not the first project we did, like third, fourth, fifth project we did, something like that it was a short film. And it got accepted into a film festival in New York where there were 167 films in this festival. And I won best editor. Oh, nice. So apparently I can do this. <laughs> I, I felt like I could, but that external validation is very meaningful. So I, you know, that that's encouraging. So then I went on and sometimes I would end up, a, I would be a director by default. Like it, it just wouldn't work with whatever scenario. It made sense for me to do it. Uh, I was almost always the producer, almost always the editor on different projects, but sometimes I'd be the director. Once in a blue moon, I'd be in a project. I don't really like to be in a project I'm directing because your focus is different. I want to watch everything that's happening. And if I'm on the other side of the camera, I'm not doing that. It can be done, but it's just a challenge I don't really enjoy. Uh, oh, Woody and, Allen does it all the time. Yes, there are there are people who do it, and they mm -hmm. do it very, very well. And I'm not saying that when I did it, it didn't work. I just don't, I don't like it. Because mm -hmm. then I'm having to rely on other people. And afterwards, I'll look at the take, and I'll say, seriously, you didn't see that? How did you not see that? That That's a problem. You didn't, We need to shoot this again. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want to be able to watch it all, and you can't when you're on camera. Mm -hmm. but um uh we've done well leap your films i mean we're we win awards and uh, right now we're finishing up a retooling of a documentary about forced marriage in africa called the bride price we're retooling it for pbs i mean we're it, it, things are working we just signed the lease on this really amazing studio space i thought we'd be over there today to do this from the space but it's a little too soon we we couldn't get our 
this is our home office. I don't know what I'm going to do with this space once we have everything over at the new studio. It's going to be interesting to uh, have this other space. I, I was telling a cousin the other day, I said, I'm going to miss being able to throw a load of laundry in the washer in the middle of my day because I could like stay up on stuff. When I feel like getting away, I'll go and prep dinner and then come back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to miss being able to do that. On the other hand, oops, sorry, I just mm -hmm. knocked my computer. On the other hand, the studio is in this old factory with peeling paint over the brick walls. It's so cool looking that I, th I think it'll be uh, interesting to just see how things happen over there. So is your daughter in the business as well? Yeah, she is. Cynthia Gray is her name. Okay. Um, she initially wanted to be a writer, which she does write. Uh, she's an actor. She, uh, so Yes Mother, she wrote Yes Mother. She's in it with me. This was a family project. Andy shot it and did the visual effects because it was shot on green screen. So all the rooms that we're in, they were all created in post. Okay. Um, and he, he did that. She scored it. She's a musician. So, um, um, and she lives in New York City where she works it's a mix so today she's actually no today she's on or is this tomorrow she's on she's background doing tai chi in some tv series today i think tomorrow she's on aquafina um she's she's working a lot as a union background actor and her whole take on that is you know she'll book an indie film where she has a supporting role or a leading role. But when it comes to the SAG, you know, the, the big projects, the big budget projects, she's usually background, but you know what? This is how she's looking at it. She's qualifying for her medical benefits and for pension credits. If you earn enough money in the union, I mean, I'm there. I get pension checks every month because I worked enough over enough years. So um, she's got her eye on the future. <laughs> She also works sometimes as a stage hand, stage manager. She's been a production assistant for us for years. And I really like having her on set because, you know, I had the chance, she kind of grew up in the business. And so she understands the need. In fact, I've got this great story about her. Mm -hmm. So Cynthia was a production assistant on a, a shoot where we were, we were in a Manhattan high rise. And we had to shoot a lot of stuff that day. It was a comedy web series, but we were shooting pieces of different episodes in this building. So we were gonna have between cast and crew, maybe like 40, 45 people there, especially at the peak of the day at lunchtime. And so one of her tasks as a PA was to make sure she had everybody's lunch order so that when it came time to eat lunch, we wouldn't be wasting any time. And we had a menu of a place across the street, a little bodega slash deli across the street. And um, so she, we're at mid-morning, unbeknownst to me, she's already got everybody's orders. It's all set up to be picked up. I didn't know any of this, uh, but that's because she knows her job. So she goes into the bathroom and she sees that the roll of toilet paper is kind of low. So um, she thought, I better find some more toilet paper. So she starts looking around in the cabinets and she can't find anything. So she's looking around elsewhere in the apartment. The owner's supposed to be there. She's left. So she can't, she doesn't even know where to ask. And then I said, hey, we need you to run down to the bodega and get some batteries for the audio guy. Here's the company credit card. So while she was down there, she got a big multi-pack of toilet paper. Can you imagine what would have happened in the middle of the day? <laughs> oh, the whole shoot would have stopped. And so she's done that without me be knowing it. She just hands the audio guy the batteries. And then um, it's lunchtime. And I looked over at her and I said, so did you get all the orders? I think maybe it's about time to break. And she just says, over there. And I look behind me. We have a table set up in the hall. And it has all the lunches individually labeled with everybody's names on them. She handled it. See, attention to detail, tedious detail. You need somebody like that on your shoot or you're going to break for lunch and say, so what do you guys want to do for lunch and spend an hour arguing over, do we really have to have pizza again? I'm not eating pizza again. Don't say I'll pizza take pizza shoot. if it's got pineapple. Do not want to have pizza. Every, no one wants to have pizza every day for lunch, especially your crew. They need to have energy for the rest of the day. So, and, and she had it all there. And I'm like, 
It's so wonderful when you're directing something and you have a good production team making everything just click along as needed. So I, I should story. reach out and have her come on here at some point too, and we can swap stories about missing our alarms. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know that was that she she made it though. She, she made, made it. it. Uh, she made it. She made it, and, and it was so funny because you know, then she, like I said, she gets picked to do the scene with Aaron, and um, that uh, that was just hilarious. <laughs> it's like winning the lottery. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I bet there was some stories going uh, around about perks during that little shoot with her. I don't know. I, I oh? don't know if. Yeah, I don't know. They. Uh, I mean, they were, they made up a scene. So the way that this unfolds, I mean, they're, Aaron's character is kind of looking the wrong direction. There's action over here mm -hmm. in the foreground. And then one of those actors breaks away and comes over and she's supposed to meet up and they have a conversation. But Aaron's over here and she didn't see what was happening. So she and my daughter devised a scenario where this is why we're talking this way. And this is why you'll turn around and see that guy. And then it's my daughter who does the thing at the right time for her to know now's the time turn. Yeah, they worked it all out. <laughs> so I think they were talking more about that than, than perks, but they had met before. We went to see Aaron in a play and st stuck around afterwards and I introduced them. So they, they actually had already met. Awesome. Do you have any uh, charities that you're passionate about that you'd like to plug on here? Oh, that's so nice of you. Yeah. Okay. So um, the, uh, hang on, there's a rescue center. The film that I did in Africa called uh -huh. The Bride Place, um, they are building a rescue center for girls who have escaped their forced marriages where they, and they've, they've already raised enough money to buy the land. They've got the blueprints for that building, the first building. I don't know if they built it yet, but you can read about it online. I need to just a second. I got to make sure I give you the right rescue all enough. A girls rescue center. If you go there, yeah, there it is. If you go to Malawi rescue.com. And Malawi is just like you'd think, M-A-L-A-W-I, MalawiRescue.com. Um, you will actually see a whole bunch of people who are in the bride price because <laughs> we got those girls on camera. Um, so they're, the plan is to house these girls. So some of them were married when they were 12, when they were 13, they were, they were sold into marriage. And there's a powerful chief there who got these girls out of these marriages. And so they've got them in a place where they can finish high school, where there can be daycare provided for children that they had, um, <clears throat> get them either ready to go on to university or learn a skill, something, something so that they'll be able to support themselves. But yeah, if people want to learn about the Alanafi Girls Rescue Center. That's at MalawiRescue.com. I appreciate that opportunity. And yeah, also, the bride price is on Vimeo if you want to watch it because the profits from that are going to the center too. And then you'll learn more about it because that's the that's the film, the bride price on Vimeo. Yeah, yeah. When I think of Africa, I think of all the unique wildlife that's there, and I notice. Oh clicking this on there there's a center for that too i don't know let me see if i can find this picture i don't know if i can even show it to you on my phone and have it show up but we had one day off <laughs> we mm -hmm. were in africa that's all we got because oh i do have some pictures on here let me see if i can make this work I took that oh. picture with my phone, trying to make sure I don't get the glare. Yeah, on I could see it clearly. Elephants. And, and that's just some of them. It was a huge, huge, huge herd of elephants. So I worked everybody to death on this film because we could only be in Africa for three weeks. And we had all the, we had our production team there, the locals. They lined up the interviews that I wanted. And, and it is with that powerful chief who's been canceling the marriages and she's awesome. And we, we had all these other people we were going to interview, but as a reward, we had 24 hours at a safari place in, a, in Luande National Park. And it was, it was a spectacular day off. 
as uh, the food there was great. We saw so many animals. Oh, I and, and they were actually of... warning us. They were warning us. They said it's you really don't see that many elephants until it's the dry season because then the park's massive. And so they don't always come where you might actually see them. So don't get your hopes up that you'll see elephants. And it was lush and green and beautiful. It was not the dry season. And yet there they were. It was like an elephant convention. <laughs> they were part so of the like, extras for the Ooh. film. Yeah, we took pictures like mad. <laughs> they it wanted to be, they wanted to get on SAG. Yes, I would sign Taft Hartley's for all the elephants if I could. <laughs> The elephants wanted to audition for the next Barbar movie. <laughs> I love elephants. What else did you see for the animals? Uh, we saw, well, there were a lot of gazelle and um, we saw it really late at night. So the, the, like you saw it, it was still daylight, but it goes into the night and, and there was a kill. We did not see the kill. The cheetahs got an elk, but it was, it was really interesting because we, you could see them. They were very, very far away, but you could see it. And then not too far off to the side was um, the herd of elk watching. And they said, they do that. They do that. They don't run away. It's like they're standing there and honoring their comrade that, well, that died to save the whole food chain. And in fact, they didn't have cheetahs in this park for a while. The elk had um, overpopulated to a point where they needed to, to do that, to bring in some predators. We saw crocodiles and hippos like mad. Hippos like, I wonder if I have a picture of the hippos. In fact, <laughs> it's a funny story. Hippos are really dangerous. Yeah. They're, hippos kill more people than just I, I heard no, I that. Don't. Kill more people than <laughs> any other animal in Africa. Like you think lions and tigers. No, no, hippos kill the most. So we're on this boat. And it's kind of a low slung boat. We're doing the the next morning we had a safari cruise. So we're looking at the different really fascinating birds and all this stuff. And we're seeing a lot of crocodiles, but we're going along and I'm I mean, like here's the edge of the boat. I'm sitting right there. The water's just here because it's a low boat. And suddenly there's this crazy boiling up of the water and up comes this hippo. I don't remember moving. And all of a sudden I'm on the other side of the boat. <laughs> I just went, because <laughs> I could have touched it. He was right next Did to me. Did he open his mouth? Um, I don't know, because I was on the other side of the boat. <laughs> I got over there and I went, how did I get over here? <laughs> Well, look we at heard this them all safari. Night. Look at this. Speaking of safari, look, 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 we just spotted a kitty. We spotted a kitty. We a skittle. Trying to see. Oh, here's our cabin at the national park. Oh, beautiful. So that's Andy, our cinematographer. It's actually it's a video, so it, it keeps it's moving on you. Oh, leave me alone. But you can see how beautiful it is. And you see the, there's the river out there where the hippos are. Um, and as we come back around, you can see the bottoms of these cabins are stone. Oh, that's our grip, Victor, mm -hmm. coming up to see us. Um, at night, they take us to the cabins, a guy with a rifle, because the hippos come up out of the water and they will drag you and take you down into the water and drown you. They're not gonna eat you, they're vegetarian, but they will kill you. So, um, he, they walk us to the cabin with the rifle and they say, if you need to come out of your cabin for any reason in the night, you contact us and we will come and get you. Do not step outside. So we're in our cabin. The next one over is where Cynthia is. Mm -hmm. And then the next one over is where the grip Victor that you saw, he's in that one. And some hippos went between Cynthia's and Victor's cabins. We could hear them down at ours, but theirs, they said, oh my God, it sounded like it was inside the, the camel. They snuffle and snort. And uh, I mean, that was kind of, that was kind of cool that they were there, but, you know, I'm glad we were all inside these stone huts. <laughs> so they oh yeah. Did you see spotted hyena? No, I don't think they have hyena in Malawi. Malawi doesn't have as wide a range of animals. They have what they call the big five. And I wonder yep. if I'm going to remember what they oh, are. Oh, I know I what they remember. are. I know what Do they you? are. Elephant, rhino, lion, yeah. leopard, and Cape buffalo. And those are the big Both. five because of the most difficult animals to hunt on foot. 
Yeah, elephant, lion, buffalo, rhino, leopard. So we saw, well, cheetah now is, you know, kind of not as big, but they have them there now. Like I said, they brought them in. So, you know, we saw, um, we didn't see a lion. I don't think we saw rhinos either. No, well, we saw the hippos and, uh, and, and like. Did you see the like Cape crazy. Buffalo? I don't think so. I don't think we did. Wow. Like I said, we had 24 hours and we were lucky to see the elephants. We were thinking, you know, this might just be a day off in a beautiful place where we take naps. But we got lucky. And well, you guys put them. a casting call out for the next Barbar movie I, I did. and the elephants came <laughs> out. They knew we were there. They knew we only had 24 hours. So it's like, please show up. <laughs> Oh, but probably really cool to see elephants. I'll say that. It was very cool to see elephants where they belong in nature. Yeah. You know, that that was wonderful. And, uh, you know, we were lucky because it took a, it took a year and a half to raise the money to, to go on this shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I didn't think we'd be able to afford to do something like that. But because our producers there, they're Malawian, they could get us the Malawi price which is way less than the tourist price. So it made it possible for us to, to get in there. Wow. And, uh, and still get our movie made, so woo -hoo. Wow, that, that's incredible. I've never been to Africa, but I watch a lot of African wildlife videos on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I had been to North Africa. I had been to Algeria and Tunisia, but that's totally different. That's Arab world, and and so it's not Sub-Saharan Africa is completely different, and I I just didn't know that I would ever get to see that. And then mm -hmm. um, our flight home, we went through Johannesburg. So I proposed to everybody. I said, look, okay, production can't pay for this. So if you say yes, you're on your own. You can fly straight home. I'm gonna stay 24 hours because I don't want to just pass through Johannesburg. When will I ever be there again? I want to see something. And everybody said yes. They were willing to spend, a, you know, something. And so we booked a hotel and um, production did buy dinner that night. We went to a, res a restaurant that had a lot of South African cuisine. I can recommend Boerwurst. Mm -hmm. uh, that was good. Um, I don't remember what else we had, but I really liked that sausage. And then the next day, Cynthia and Andy went spelunking. They, there's some old caves there. And the rest of us went on a tour of Soweto. And I mean, having lived through the era of apartheid and, and Nelson Mandela coming up and, and so forth, I mean, that all had a lot of meaning to me and I wanted to see it. And I mean, Soweto is still abysmally poor. But um, it, it was meaningful to go through there and see the, the actual place. Uh, and then, you know, we all reconvened at the hotel and headed off to the airport. So we didn't see a lot, but... You see any snakes? Mm -mm. No snakes, huh? No, we saw a lot of monkeys. A lot ah. of monkeys. In yeah. In fact, oh my gosh, when we first arrived at the... At, at Umvu camp, mm -hmm. we, they served us these little cookies and we had some tea and we're sitting, we're just sitting in the lobby relaxing for a minute. It is a wild ride to get there. I mean, the roads are like this. Yeah. Like the color road in Malawi is rough. So we're sitting there and suddenly, I didn't even know what happened at first, a plate that was on the table just flew across the room like a frisbee and smashed into the wall, cookies going everywhere, except one of them, a monkey got it. It was a monkey that just zipped through and took off. And they're like, oh, those monkeys. They're so mad. Those monkeys are always coming up. When we went into the dining room, they had like a, like fish netting all the way around all the openings to keep the monkeys from coming in and stealing people's dinners. <laughs> so they were pretty mischievous, those monkeys. But I mean, I thought they were cute. There you go. <laughs> well, you know what? It... Um... It was wonderful having you come on here today, you know, and uh, I thank you once again for being so understanding. I hate being late for an interview and that happened today, but I loved it, loved it when you shared the story of your daughter uh, having a similar situation, you know, but and but my my excuse i worked the hospital and i just did not hear the alarm and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good know. excuse so i you know i'm glad that you at least got to have some sleep so it, it it's and it's fine i mean all i have to do today is like go to the grocery store where no one's going to know who i am 
Yeah, but will the monkeys be there to steal your food? No, it's a really boring grocery store. No fish netting up and around? No. 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 Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, Africa is a great place. I've never been there. But like I said, I watch a lot of those videos. I'm glad you got to see the elephant. So yeah, me too. For me, that was a huge, huge highlight of the trip. That and meeting Chief Kachinamoto, who is one of my idols, this woman who's canceled all these marriages. I mean, I just adore her. And she was a great, great interview, which is why, I mean, I know I have a vested interest, but I do highly recommend The Bride Price on Vimeo because it, you will learn a lot and you will enjoy yourself because she is a great interview. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Do you get a website and stuff like that you want to plug on here? Yeah, uh, leapyearfilms.com. That'll mm -hmm. tell you what we're up to, what we've been doing for the last decade or so, and what we're up to as filmmakers. My own website, jenniferenscott.com, that is more like a photo album of work, and it's got my reels and voiceover reels and me speaking French and stuff. <laughs> It's just, that's just, you know, I don't, I don't know how often anybody ever really uses those sites, but actors are expected to have them. Mm -hmm. And you see how to spell my name. It's right on there. Yep. Oh yeah. I'll get it right. I'll get it right. But right <laughs> now right, you're right. working, you're working on Barbar, the, the live action movie with real elephants, right? Is that what you're no, working on? No, I'm not. But actually <laughs> a, a writer I know, he wrote Modern Family. He's I think he's in South Africa right now. And he told me he wants to bring back an elephant. <laughs> he's going to have a bar living in his condo bathroom. <laughs> you know what? I, I interviewed. Feeling, I have a feeling it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's funny you say that. I interviewed Joe Camp, who is the guy that directed all those Benji movies. Yeah, and right yeah. now he, um, he directed all those Benji movies. Right now, he and his wife raise horses. But he said one of the th dr one of his dreams was to get a couple of elephants. But he says his wife won't let him. <laughs> They're a lot of work. You have to wash their. You have to clean their skin all the time, or it dries out. It's and not only that, they eat a lot. <laughs> they do. They do. I learned all of that on Sesame Street. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Oh, you know what? It was wonderful having you come on here today, you know, and uh, and uh, like I said, if your daughter wants to come on here, I'm more than more than happy to have her come on here. Maybe she'll make Babar the musical live. You action. never know. She did just write a musical. I will I will give her your contact info. <laughs> Absolutely. And the other. About Ellison, but she did write a musical. <laughs> There you go. Anyway, there you go. All right. Well, Greg, thank you. It was very nice uh, to meet you, and I appreciate you reaching out. And I'm happy to talk about Perks because it was a, it was a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful film. Yeah, I got the Blu-ray here. I'm so you happy. Here? To... There you go. Yeah, I enjoyed this movie very, very much. I was happy to have you come on here and talk about this. And uh, yeah, I can't believe it's been 10 years since I saw this movie. I know. Movie. I was digging stuff out just to see. I mean, that script has my oh, name. Oh, wow. I still have my script. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What's your daughter think about this and Zach and Marie make a porno? She hated Zach and Mary. Uh, I mean, she liked my scene in it. She hated it. Um, she, she doesn't like the sexy stuff and uh, but I, I think she liked perks but you know what her take on it is totally different because she grew up with a mother my cat is now pushing on the computer she grew up <laughs> with a mom who was in the business so in her mind this is just what her mom does you know what I mean it's like if your parent was if your mother was a nurse you might not think oh nursing is so amazing you would know it from that being her job so you would look at it very differently and so I, I don't know how impressed she is with any of it. <laughs> to her, it's just a viable way of making a living that she does enjoy. So uh, Zach and Marie make a porno is not part of her uh, private collection. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> 
Well, you know what? It, like I said, it was wonderful having you come on here and talk about this. And even inter introducing me to Blood Song. I'm going to try to check that out, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you can find it. I, I just, I can't help you with that one. I don't know. I'll have to check it out. I, I love horror movies from that time, especially, you know? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you no, got kitty. Okay. Look at that. Here's, you get kitty. Something. There you go. What's your kitty's name? Festus. Yeah. <laughs> you're, a, you're an internet star. Will you get down though? I want you to get down. He's knocking everything over, you know, like they do. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, mine likes to jump on me while I'm sleeping. Cause I got a CPAP machine. Cause I have sleep apnea and uh, my cat will come up and he'll rub against that thing. <laughs> I'm like Skittles. Really? Really? <laughs> Feels so good. You don't understand. <laughs> Scratches them. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? No, I don't mind at all. What do you want me to say? Just state your name and say that we're celebrating the tenth anniversary of the perks of being a wallflower, and say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. Okay. Hey, this is Jennifer Enscott celebrating the 10th anniversary of the release of The Perks of Being a Wallflower. You want to tune in and watch this. I'm being interviewed by Greg Gilbert about perks and many, many other things on Python Radio. Is that what you said? Python's Paradise. <laughs> but people Python's call it Paradise. I'm sorry, everybody. On Python's Paradise. I needed to write my lines down ahead of You time. know what? You're not the first to call it Python Radio, so... Python's know, my I DJ like name. Something DJ era. Ben, I just told you my age. <laughs> you know what? You can't be much older than me. Come on. Oh, I'm a lot older than you. I was in college when you were born. You're not supposed to say that. <laughs> I was born I, in 1972, so. Yeah, I, I, no, I wasn't in college. I was, I was a senior in high school. So I, uh, yeah, I, I, I still, to this day, I still play younger than I am by quite a lot. You don't so, look your age, I'll tell you that. I, I, I don't, I don't. Neither does Cynthia, by the way, but you won't get her to give her age away. But you know, she, she looks like she's in high school. So, yeah. You know what? I looked at some pictures of her as we were doing the interview. She kind of has an Anne Hathaway kind of vibe oh. to her. <laughs> she gets that all the time. In fact, people say, has anyone ever told her? Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't even need to <laughs> hear the end of it. Yes, every day she gets told she looks like Anne Hathaway. She looks very much like Anne Hathaway. There you go. Um, there you go. Yeah, well, we, in you... fact, we were saying at the time I told Emma that she looked more like me than my daughter, my actual daughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, you tell, you tell, um, um, Cynthia to come on here you know I'd love to have her on here yeah I'll tell well, her I'm, I'm I'll, always I'll I'm always open to uh new stories and and uh have new people on here you know and and um it's great networking as well so yeah it is and, and then you do see like I was saying how it, it's kind of a small world you, you mm -hmm. don't realize until you start talking about it everybody knows everybody and you're all connected so you're being stalked. Hi. You're being stalked. <laughs> Look over your shoulder. You're being stalked. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Kitty wants to go on the internet. He, wants, he, yeah, he, he does plenty. He wants to go on. <laughs> he wants to go on cat Facebook. <laughs> Look at his tail stuck up in the air like that. He's so proud. He is. He's an alpha male. He's a very proud boy. <laughs> Don't step on the keyboard, honey. <laughs> he's not stepping on it. He's just trying to he type was. something I out. Got I got projects there. I don't want him to mess up. <laughs> he uh, wants to help you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much for uh, allowing me on today. If it's okay with you, I, I want to send you a friend's request on Facebook if that's okay. Sure, of course. Yeah. I'll do that, you know, and um, when this is ready, I'll send you the link, you know, it'll be unlisted on YouTube for a while, 
because I kind of release them um, in order, you know, but when it, when it is given to you, unlisted or not, you can still post it. Oh, I, I'll wait until you post it. That's because it's fair. I don't want to steal your thunder. I'll, yeah, I'll... but here's the thing. I never know. I'm still releasing stuff public from last year. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. What it I do is... might not be is, anniversary anymore once. <laughs> well, here's what I do. I'm going to tell you my story here. When I started doing this, my uh, former station manager said, don't release interviews right at once. He said, save some for a rainy day. Right. COVID ran, ended up being a rainy day because when the station went into lockdown, I had no way to do this until one of my guests suggested Zoom. And uh, I went the rest of 2020 without being able to do a show. But I was lucky to have about 150 interviews that I hadn't put public. Yeah. So I had a nice backlog. So what I do is I send the unlisted link and they can post it. <laughs> that, that still gives you some publicity, even though you're not. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I don't want yet. people to wait forever, but it also allows them to get it out there. And and uh, the it there's a lot of them that get lots of views even before I post it, so it allows it, mm -hmm. you know. So I will send it to you when it's ready, and uh, you can post it and uh, and. Uh, and your daughter come on here and she can find out that we're talking about her elephant project. <laughs> I will tell her. Absolutely. Okay, have Thank you so much for being a gloriously wonderful human being. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks You're for the welcome. fun time. It was fun. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.